working for HUD, according to your testimony, on October 1982. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. And you testified in response to a question that uh, you first met Miss Linda Murphy while she was working at HUD. Is that correct? Yes, I think when I reported on board in October of 1982, she was just getting ready to leave the department. Right. Well, in point of fact, Ms. Murphy left the department in May of 1982. Okay, well. Now, let me explain to you why I find this testimony so remarkably interesting. And uh, your impression uh, was not an inaccurate impression. When Ms. Murphy testified before the subcommittee, one of the items that uh, the subcommittee found remarkable is that although not a HUD employee anymore, she was routinely involved in being supplied internal HUD documents. She participated in the drafting of HUD documents. It would have been perfectly natural for you to assume when you came on board, seeing her around, that she would be a HUD employee. In fact, she left five months before you came on board. So let me pursue this matter, because I'm not critical of your testimony. You went there in October, and you saw her around the place. That's basically what you were saying, isn't it? Well, I, I, Because she was no longer a HUD employee. What probably happened then was someone had mentioned to me that she was a HUD employee, but I did see her in the building from time to That's time. Right. And, uh, Perhaps it was mentioned to me that she, would, she had worked in the, in the state bond finance program. That's probably the case. And, right. and Mr. Chairman, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm going back I'm not at all critical of your, right. of your confusing that, and right. I want you to understand that. Uh, what this reflects on is not your faulty memory, because your memory is quite good. You saw her around, and presumably she functioned or appeared to be functioning, as far as you were concerned, as a HUD employee. But in point of fact, she had left about five months earlier. Okay. Yes? Did you ever have any contacts with her during that time? Not that I can recall, Mr. Shays, other than, as I was saying, I, I saw her and I was told it she was She never came into your office and asked you not a question? That I can, not that I can recall. <laughs> Mr. Barksdale, we want to thank you for your testimony. I would like to ask a question. How soon may the committee expect to receive that list that we talked about? I will try to get it back to you as, as, as uh, soon as I can, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to get it back within the next uh, two weeks. That's, that's very good. We want to thank you for your testimony. Well, thank sir. you very much, Mr. Lantos. Thank you. The final witness uh, <clears throat> today's hearing is uh, Mr. John Knapp, uh, former general counsel of HUD. <coughs> Raise your right hand, Mr. Knapp. You solemnly swear, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I so help. For the record, of course, you're appearing on a voluntary basis, Mr. Knapp. And uh, we have a number of issues we'd like to explore with you. To set the stage, uh, you first appeared before this subcommittee on May 25. <clears throat> During the course of that testimony, among other things, you testified with respect to an oral opinion that you rendered basically saying that regulations pertaining to the allocation of Section 8 mud rehab funds were suspended by Congress's waiver of the fair share statute. A uh, couple of weeks later, on June 9, you wrote the subcommittee stating in a lengthy, carefully crafted letter that your testimony was, quote, historically inaccurate, uh, end quote. 
<coughs> you wrote, it appears reasonably certain that in fact I did not give the quote opinion, end quote, oral or otherwise, regarding inapplicability of the regulatory selection criteria to which I admitted and testified last week. End of quote from your letter. And my understanding is a career staff attorney, Mr. Robert Kennison, to whom uh, you testified, you gave the oral opinion, wrote to you after your testimony before the subcommittee informing you that you had never discussed the matter. Is this a fairly accurate description of what the background is? Uh, that is a correct summary. Uh, I can expand upon it if Please you wish. Please do. As I had discussed in my testimony the, uh, the first time, um, both my, uh, my written statement and my oral testimony, uh, there had supposedly been two parts to the verbal opinion that I was supposed to have given. Um, again, to go back a minute, uh, the genesis of this, I think, was the statement in the Inspector General's audit report on the moderate rehabilitation program that I had given a verbal opinion uh, that, as I said, had two parts to it. Um, I said in my statement um, and, and in my testimony that I had a recollection as to the first of those parts, namely that when Congress waived to section, uh, section 213D, that that meant render the fair share regulation itself, uh, the department's <coughs> fair share regulation, which was stated to be an implementation of 213D, that that rendered two, uh, part 791 please, inoperative. Please do me a favor yes. and try to use. I'm trying again to use. Try to use legalese to, references minimally because I, it I, doesn't help us. I have to do it uh, in order to separate the two parts of what I'm talking about, if you can bear with me. Well, Mr. Knapp, whenever you use technical terms that are understood only by attorneys who deal with these matters, after using the technical terms, use English terms that make the testimony understandable to the rest of the universe. The second part of the opinion that was attributed to me in the Inspector General's report uh, was that as a result of this, uh, funding decisions for the Mod Rehab Program became discretionary. And in terms of the Department's regulation governing the Mod Rehab Program, uh, that seemed to come down to a question that the selection criteria that are in the regulation for the ranking of applications received from uh, public housing authorities, that those selection criteria were no longer mandatory. I said in my testimony that I could not recall having given that opinion but essentially, I accepted the, uh, the statement in the Inspector General's report <coughs> that I had. I said that while I could not recall having given it, um, <coughs> having looked at the regulation after I was uh, invited to come up here, uh, I thought I could see a basis on which I might have given it. And in my testimony, I described that basis. Um, afterwards, when I, fin I, I had also said in my testimony that I had discussed this subject briefly with Mr. Kennison, who was the senior career lawyer uh, in this area, in this program area, and with whom I said if I would have discussed it, I would have discussed this subject if I had discussed it with anybody. I would have discussed it with him alone, or if someone else had raised it, I would have discussed it with him before responding to it. As I said in my later letter, uh, I think my uh, conversation with Mr. Kennison had been perhaps too brief. Uh, 
and also I think perhaps I talked more than I should have listened in that conversation. Uh, he confirmed to me that the first part of the opinion, namely the Congressional fair, uh, fair Share Waiver suspended the Department's Fair Share Regulation. He confirmed to me that we had discussed that and that was what I had said and that was the, the message that he had conveyed back. I discussed the second part of it and said, I don't remember giving this, but I can see why I might have given it, and I think I spelled out to him the, the kind of rationale that I suggested here in the committee. Uh, and I believe that I referred in that conversation with him to saying, for example, I can see that certain other criteria might have become applicable and more appropriate in this kind of a situation, such as, for example, the, uh, the criteria uh, for the headquarters reserve, which was a special piece of legislation that Senator Armstrong had um, sponsored a couple of years before to govern discretionary funding of the, of the headquarters reserve. Mr. Kennison said, we had never discussed that, which I took to be a reference simply to this question of the applicability of the headquarters reserve criteria, apparently he must have meant that we had never discussed the question that preceded that either, namely the suspension of the application selection criteria that are in the mod rehab regulation. In any case, after my testimony, as I described in my letter, um, and after he had seen tapes uh, of the hearing and, and perhaps seen a transcript. I don't know that he had seen a transcript. Uh, he called me and then followed with a letter to me saying that he and I had never discussed that second question about the application ranking criteria in the modern rehab regulation. He said, in fact, that he did not think that he had dis ever discussed mod rehab specifically with me at all that the question uh, as to the effect of the Congressional Waiver of Fair Share on the Fair Share Regulation uh, was a general question as it applied to all of the Section 8 programs to which the, uh, to which the statute would have been applicable and not with specific reference to any particular program within it. I then called the uh, uh, the Inspector General's office, uh, the person whom I uh, had been informed had been the one who had been conducting in interviews or prepared the audit report, uh, asked him for his source. Uh, that person said that somebody had told him that I had given such an opinion. Uh, he identified who that was to me. I called that person who identified who he thought had told me. I traced it back a stage or two and it was clear, at least from what I had heard, uh, nobody actually had recalled my giving that second oral opinion. As I said in my, in my letter, um, and part of the reason, a major reason I think why Mr. Kennison had bothered to call me and to correct this was that whenever the question had come up to him, and I believe it did not, or at least he has not been able to recall an instance when it did it, for a couple of years, but uh, several years later when the question came up to him in some detail about the mod rehab funding system, um, he advised that those application ranking criteria were applicable to the system that, to the, to the headquarters controlled funding decisions. And he said that uh, you know, he never would have given that advice at that time if I had ruled otherwise at an earlier time. Uh, and I knew that to be true because I know Mr. Kennison. Um, that is what led to my, uh, to my letter to the committee in which I said uh, that the first part of the opinion to wh which was attributed to me 
uh, I gave. Um, and it was well known within the department. It was reflected in, in any number of funding documents or planning documents in the department thereafter. The, the second part of the opinion that was specific reference to the Mod Rehab Program, uh, that the application criteria that are in the regulation are not applicable, uh, that question was never raised with me, and I never gave advice on that question. Extraordinary situation, Mr. Knapp. <clears throat> and you'll have to bear with us, non-lawyers, if you just want to walk you through it. Your oral opinion seemed to have taken a, on a life of its own. An oral opinion that you now claim you never made becomes the basis of all kinds of decisions by all kinds of people within the department, including the secretary. And when you testify before this committee, presumably preparing for the testimony very carefully, as your prepared testimony clearly demonstrates, for which I commend you, you testify with respect to an oral opinion that was never uttered. Can, can you help us to understand this a bit better? I think that I can take through you, and, and obviously since my second invitation, I've, uh, I've asked some more questions, um, hoping not to be back a third time. Um, well, we enjoy having you, but we also I, hope you won't I'd assume uh, have pass to come it up, back. As the saying time, goes. Yeah. <coughs> um, as to what actually happened in FY 84, 85, and 86, um, it, I don't know that that history is, is all that illuminating, but I can, I, I can take you through well, it. Well, I, I, I really don't want to get bogged down in okay. technical details. That is the last thing I want. Let me, let me approach it perhaps differently. At a certain point in time, Congress has in effect what we have come to call fair share requirements. Is that correct? That's correct. Define for me what Congress meant by fair share requirements. That housing assistance under, uh, this, generally speaking, the, the housing subsidy programs uh, would be allocated geographically in accordance with a formula devised by the, uh, the department and uh, reflected in a regulation uh, that would attempt to measure relative need for assisted housing uh, on, uh, on a statistical, using certain statistical data. And when the funds for this program are cut very sharply, so that you really cannot allocate it to 50 states because there really isn't an enough money to allocate it to 50 states. Congress then says the fair share formula is no longer mandatory. It certainly remains optional, does it not? That's correct. Okay. So Congress said you don't have to allocate it to the 50 states because there isn't enough money to go around to the 50 states. But Congress presumably implies that it wants the allocation to take place on the basis of objective, measurable, reasonable criteria. Is that accurate? Congress didn't send a message, as Deborah Dean says in her interview with the Wall Street Journal, that the program should be run on a political basis, does it? No. The um, intent of Congress is to continue to have allocation done on the basis of need. Is that correct? That is correct, but I would just uh, interject uh, that there are a lot of different ways and recognized ways uh, of recognizing need. Uh, it might be on a geographical basis uh, with, let's say, as we mentioned, the statistical data, including pre-1940 housing stock and so forth. Uh, 
when Congress recognized what had been the Department's previous practice of holding back, I think previously it had been 20 percent, Congress said not more than 15 percent. Uh, of housing uh, authority from the fair share process, that there would then be criteria that govern that use of the headquarters reserve as well. Uh, those are separate categories of housing need or special circumstances, but they're, you know, they're not formula uh, derived, such as like fair share. So there are different ways of recognizing need or yeah, certain are, kinds of circumstances. Yeah. But there's something you can point to. In your letter to me of June 9, you quote Mr. Kennison as saying, Mr. Kennison has advised me that his consistent advice to the MUD rehab, rehab program staff has been that the objective selection criteria continued to be applicable even when funds were not geographically fair shared and funding decisions were made in headquarters. Is that correct? That is correct, and I have, and he has shared with me uh, you know, the, the papers that he has, the, the historical papers that he has, uh, in which he has given that kind of advice. Uh, the, the first such one that he has been able to, to find, uh, where he specifically gave that advice, that the regulatory criteria, application ranking criteria, continue to be applicable to the headquarters selection process uh, was a comment on the proposed system for distribution in fiscal 1986. Now, not only don't I have any trouble with Mr. Kennison's view, but I fully share his view. You obviously should use objective selection criteria. And when you do away with the geographic allocation pattern, which I believe is exactly what I told you when you were here on May 25. You need other objective criteria all the more. You, you give up geographic allocation. You have a set of additional criteria. You not only want to retain those, you minimally want to retain those, but ideally you add to them because now you have lost the geographic criteria. Would you agree with that? You want to retain either those or, or some of those and some others. You want to That's maintain right. at least criteria that you can point to. Well, if you give up one set of criteria, the geographic criteria, you minimally wish to retain what you have or strengthen them. That's correct. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, as I said the first time, uh, if the function of the geographic formula was to determine need, then at least you would want to strengthen uh, the criteria, it seems to me, that specifically addressed relative need for housing of this type. Now, speculate with me, if you would, Mr. Knapp. How did your never given oral legal opinion gain such wide currency at HUD? First, I don't know that it did gain wide <coughs> currency at HUD. I don't know that uh, well, I've heard anything Well, it crept into the IG said. report. Well, it, but, but he's quoting someone in 1988 or 89 uh, that he spoke to saying he heard that, and it, it turns out it goes back and it doesn't turn out to be quite well, so. Well, Sam Pierce made a reference to it in his testimony. He made the reference to it in his testimony because he knew what my testimony was going to be. Well. Mr. Knapp, Mr. Knapp, he here is the Secretary of him. HUD who refers to your oral opinion never given. Here is the Inspector General dealing with your oral opinion never given. What higher authorities within the HUD universe need one point to? I mean, the top man refers to your oral opinion and the top internal watchdog refers to your oral opinion, which we now discover was never uttered. I mean, there must be an explanation of how this developed. And at the same time, when the Mod Rehab funding process was being developed, 
in each of these years within the Office of Housing uh, and within the Mod Rehab uh, Office itself, too. Uh, there would be conversations between the program staff uh, and, and my staff, either within the, the Division for Assisted Housing or, or with Mr. Kennison. Um, there would be criticisms or suggestions as to the process that they were utilizing. Uh, there was, for example, a, and the Mod Rehab or the, uh, the Office of Housing, I can't say I know necessarily everybody who saw this, uh, was shown a, what was then a draft opinion for signature by Mr. Kennison uh, to an assistant of Mr. Boxdale. Uh, which talked about the process that they were proposing for that year, which was a centralized process. And for example, ended with the paragraph saying, a centralized selection process is legally acceptable if there is a reasonable and reasonably systematic administrative process for decision on the PHA request. The character of the selection process should be documented by an administrative record of the factors considered and the basis for the HUD decisions. Now, that does not make a specific reference to the regulatory application ranking criteria that we are talking about. This memo, which in fact was not ultimately signed, but the, the, because of another point, I think, uh, but was known by the housing staff, and I believe up to the Assistant Secretary's office, uh, did not advise that the regulatory criteria had to be used, but they had to have criteria. So this was not a, an environment in which they were being told, do whatever you want and, and do it without any known criteria. You wrote to me, Mr. Knapp, and I quote, the application of the regulatory scheme would hardly have driven discretion out of the program. What do you mean by that? What I meant by that is I referred to two things within the paragraph. Uh, where that statement is made, Mr. Chairman. One of them is the regulatory selection criteria that, that we are talking about here, uh, which themselves uh, have some, have judgmental factors within them. Uh, who has administrative capacity, um, the availability of financing, uh, there are some ju there are judgments to be made within those criteria. Then the regulation says that the that the selections are to be made on the basis of uh, who has the best combination of those criteria. So it's there's some greater level of discretion and judgment and re under those criteria than there would be to say under a strict statistical formula such as, a fair, let's say, the fair share uh, uh, formula itself. Do you condone the manner in which the Mud Rehab program was run after the mandatory fair share allocation ended? I can't say that I condone. Um, what I have heard, the, the impression at least that one gets from what I've heard through these hearings uh, of the way a fair number of mod rehab funding decisions were made. Um, again, as I think uh, had been uh, noted in some of the uh, earlier hearings, uh, a broad view of who got funding and how in these years uh, is not available in, in the IG's report. There is anecdotal about how some awards were made, but it doesn't 
purport to say how all were made or what percentage were made this way. Uh, and But I it's think not, that if, I think if you'll allow me, if I may yeah. just continue, also. Please. No, I just want to react to yeah. the point you just made. I don't think it's accurate to say that the evidence is anecdotal at all. We have very clear statistical evidence, for instance, that Puerto Rico, which should have gotten on any reasonable basis a fraction of what New York State got, in fact got more than New York State that California got a very small share, far less than what California on the basis of any set of statistical criteria should have gotten. So the evidence is far from just anecdotal. The evidence is both statistical and there are, you are correct, horrendous anecdotal pieces of evidence indicating blatant influence peddling. But that's not all we uncovered. We uncovered the whole spectrum and the statistical analysis condemns the way the program was run. I, would, uh, I don't want to raise uh, or, or spend time on uh, points that have been made previously. Well, I, I, want series, ask, I, think, I, I want to ask you to react to this because you, yes. you, you try to minimize the IG's criticism as anecdotal and I reject that. No, I'm not criticizing the IG's uh, criticism is anecdotal. I think what has been said be once before was the, as far as the, the overall funding of the program in each of these years, 84, 85, 86, and so forth, uh, tended to gloss over somewhat. Uh, I think that most of the, uh, uh, the awards that were particularly criticized tended to come somewhat later in the period than earlier. Uh, I'm not really aware, for example, of, of stories of people who got, let's say, uh, awards who shouldn't have in 84, 85. Um, as far as some of the geographic factors that you've mentioned, particularly with reference to California and New York, I think others here have, uh, have, have noted uh, some of the program constraints itself that makes the program not all that usable in areas such as most particularly California and New York as opposed to some others uh, uh, where costs and rents may have been lower and within the, you know, the things we workable within the rent constraints of this particular program. Uh, at the same time, I don't want to argue with it uh, that the way, at least one hit, what one has read about a good many of the selections that have been focused upon, uh, I would not condone. Uh, Mr. Knapp, I want to shift to another issue um, which relates to a memorandum by Assistant Secretary Moran to staff saying that Section 8 mod rehab funds can be counted as private investment for purposes of qualifying for another HUD program, so-called UDAG program. Now, to the naked eye, it appears that private investment is private investment. Private investment is not public subsidy. When Mr. Moran issued this memorandum, he said public subsidy can be counted as private investment, which on in the face of it is absurd. Do you recall seeing this memorandum? Was the legal counsel involved in issuing this memorandum? Uh, did you have I, any discussions, Mr. Moran? I do not believe that I did. Were you aware of this memorandum? I'm not certain. I, I don't believe that I saw the memorandum um, until last week. Did, did Mr. Moran need to seek your approval before issuing such a memorandum? No. Ex it was a, uh, as I understand, this is a, what was regarded there as a, uh, as a policy memorandum and within the Office of uh, 
within the UDAC staff and the UDAC program, uh, there had been various policy memoranda been issued uh, since the inception of the program. Um, if I may go back a, a bit to comment on what I, not what I necessarily knew then, but what I understand now. As Mr. Moran's uh, memorandum indicates, uh, at the very beginning of the program, the second round in 1978, it says here, a decision was made uh, to not combine UDAG with Section 8 new construction or substantial rehab. Why was the decision made? As I am told, I am told that it was a direct decision by Secretary Harris and the basis of the decision was that the subsidy provided by those programs was so deep that you really could never really show a but-for necessity for the UDAG. Go ahead. And the, the memorandum says history confirms the basis of the policy decisions in that the section program was able to get its uni units underway without UDAG subsidy. As I indicated, that policy was adopted in 1978. Uh, it was directly applicable to, and the background of it was the new construction and substantial rehab programs because those are the only Section 8 programs that there were at that time other than certificates. The Mod Rehab Program uh, was created in 1979, I believe. In 1985, the policy was revisited because I'm told there were several, uh, three I think is the number that I've been given, uh, proposals in-house that would have combined UDAG with Mod Rehab. One of them, One was, of them was the Durham Hosiery Mill. Uh -huh. Which were the other two? Uh, I don't know. Okay. And the policy was reconsidered at that time, and I'm told that the basis for reconsidering it was that uh, the Mod Rehab was a very much shallower subsidy. So that the argument that you could never establish a but for uh, which was applicable when you had such a deep subsidy as new construction of sub rehab section 8 uh, just didn't really apply to mod rehab and that I'm told is the basis on which this policy memorandum was issued now I don't believe that Mr. Moran uh, or anyone else on his staff uh, raised any issue about this with me at the time what I do know um, is that after issuing the memorandum and in early September 1985, for what reason I don't know and he can't recall, uh, I've discussed this with Mr. Moran recently, uh, he asked his staff to make sure that Mr. Kennison, again Mr. Kennison, this is his program area as well, uh, cleared this, found no legal problem uh, with this uh, policy, which had already been issued, but which I don't think had entered into any, uh, any UDAG funding decision yet. Um, and Mr. Kennison has advised me that he then advised the staff, the UDAG program staff, that there was no legal objection to this policy. Do you agree with that uh, decision? Yes, I do, and I want to clarify one thing. Um, the question is sometimes referred to counting mod rehab funds or counting subsidy as private investment. Uh, what is being talked about here is counting the upfront private cost of the rehab as private investment notwithstanding that that cost may be amortized over a period of years from an income stream to which a subsidy contributes. Um, 
and there are other examples of somewhat similar policies within the uh, within the UDAC programs, uh, such as, for example, uh, public agency leases. Uh, if the lease, and I think that the policy is that if the lease get, in effect covers more than 90 percent of the debt service, uh, then that's really considered not a private risk but a public <laughs> risk, and so forth. So it's it's the upfront. Uh, mm -hmm. rehab cost that is counted as the private investment. Ms. Knapp, uh, when you left HUD, you joined a private law firm? That is correct. Which one? Powell, Goldstein, Fraser, I'm and I'm sorry? Powell, Goldstein, Fraser, and Murphy, my current firm. That's the only law firm you have worked for since you left HUD? That is correct. Uh, when I left HUD, I went with the law firm, and I also uh, signed on as a consultant to a consultant firm uh, in town. Um, what I'm not, I'm not doing that anymore. What was that firm? The firm's name was ICG. It did. It, it represented a coalition of major single-family builders. Was its principal uh, uh, business. Um, I think during the uh, during the during the year following my uh, HUD employment or uh, termination of my HUD employment, um, I received I think about fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars from that. Um, I did not continue it. And that's the only HUD-related consulting you did that's since correct. leaving HUD. And I don't believe that any of it was really HUD-related or at least it did not involve contacts with HUD. Did you ever do any work with Linda Murphy after you left HUD? I don't believe so. <coughs> My final questions relate to the Colonial House project. To refresh your memory, there was a co-insured mortgage loan totaling $47.2 million on this. After default, the property was sold for $8.9 million. Taxpayer lost about $40 million on this project. Um, are you familiar with the history of the project? Not very much at all. Well, then let me ask specific questions. I, excuse me. I, Please. I heard Mr. Boxdale's testimony this morning. That's all? that you know about it? And I had discussed it with him in a telephone conversation last week, essentially the same history. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Barksdale testified before us a little while ago that when he found out about this uh, impending disaster, he wanted to stop it because he knew the housing market was so bad in Houston that to undertake a giant project with 1,818 units would end up in a disaster, and of course it did. Did he or any member of his staff approach your office during the coinsurance approval process to ask whether he had the authority to stop the project? I don't believe that he approached me. Uh, whether someone on his staff approached someone on my staff, uh, I assume that they probably did. Um, and it's not impossible that he may have uh, called me or, or come up to see me, and if, and if he had raised the question then, what I would have done was to have called someone on my staff. Um, I have no recollection of that, and uh, uh, from conversing with him last week, he, he doesn't either, though he thinks that might have happened. But in, whether he had come to me or not, I'm sure that somebody uh, would have raised the question uh, with my staff. And I know that the, uh, that the staff's position then would have been, as I understand it is now, because the question has come up from time to time since then, uh, including on a number I understand of recent occasions, 
um, that when an approved co-insuring lender issues a commitment, it is issuing that commitment on the department's behalf as to the department's portion of the co-insurance. And so just as in the full insurance program, when the department itself issues a commitment to insure, if the borrower and the lender close the loan in accordance with the commitment and present it for endorsement, the department is legally obligated to endorse for insurance. If he had, if whoever, I believe, uh, would have asked the question at that time, uh, would have received that answer then. And I'm pretty sure that in a similar situation, where, let me make clear, the only question that has been raised is one regarding underwriting judgments. Now, I understand that you would think that the that the questions raised by Colonial House about underwriting judgments were not small questions, they were large questions. But nevertheless, they were questions relating to underwriting judgments, predictions of the future. That when that is the only thing that the department doesn't like uh, about the way an co-insurer has processed a loan for which it is given a commitment, the department does not have the ability to back out of uh, the commitment to which it has been bound. Well, I don't like your answer, Mr. Knapp, for a whole lot of reasons. Because it's the worst kind of bureaucratic legalese that has gotten us into this multi-billion dollar mess. <coughs> Had Mr. Barksdale come to you, let's hypothesize this. You are not sure whether he came to you or whether he came to a member of your staff. But you are sort of saying, had he come to me, I would have told him there is nothing I can do. Is that right? That's correct. OK. Well, had Mr. Barksdale come to you and said, look, this is, and I'm quoting the HUD official in charge there, this is active insanity. This is active insanity. We are obligating ourselves to the tune of $47 million and not in a million years are we going to get back the $47 million. Help me, General Counsel, help me. Give me an answer other than this bureaucratic garbage that we cannot do anything. What happens if you stop payment on the check and let them sue you? And in the meantime, you develop what has been developed, that they were engaged in fraud. First, when you talk fraud, uh, I don't know that there is what at least is generally considered to be fraud involved in this case, and that I have not at least heard of any uh, instances of misrepresentation or a hiding of material factors or something like that. Um, what was, I mean, as Mr. Boxdale himself said, what was causing him concern was what was known, not, not, not what was unknown. All I can say about uh, that, your, your suggestion, Mr. Chairman, is that um, that is the, the essence of the co-insurance program, as it is the essence of the FHA full insurance program. When a commitment is given, a commitment is a commitment is a commitment. It's, it's worth something. You don't have to worry about someone backing out of it at the end because they've said, I've changed my mind about this. And that is true when it's FHA that issues a commitment in a full insurance program. It's true when a co-insurer issues a commitment in the co-insurance program. Otherwise, it isn't worth anything, and the program isn't worth anything. Now, even when uh, the department takes an action which it did not in this case at that time, and, and I don't even know that it's what the department did later on uh, when, when Mr. Boxdale imposed his uh, restrictions on their ability to issue commitments. Even if the department had taken the action of suspending DRG at that time, it would still have honored the commitments that DRG had issued 
prior to its suspension. That is how important commitments are in the program, and, and that's how important they are to is that the program what, itself. Is that what Secretary Kemp has done when he suspended programs in the last few months? In that particular area, yes, I believe so. I don't know of an instance where he has said that any outstanding commitments are no good anymore. Of course he said. He stopped all MOD rehab awards. No, he's, well, he stopped reservations of MOD rehabs where there had been no binding, where there had been no that's AHAPs called entered into. That's called commitments. It's not the same as an insurance commitment. Well, there explain the difference to me. In the MOD rehab program, there, uh, there is a reservation of authority. And then the next stage is you enter into an agreement to enter into housing assistance payments. That's when the department becomes uh, contractually obligated under the terms of the com contract itself to provide, uh, to begin to provide subsidy upon the completion of the project. As I understand it, what has, uh, in the FY89 that he um, reversed, none of those projects had reached that stage. Nothing in that, to, in that program had reached what uh, would be regarded as a commitment stage. In retrospect, you have no other judgment except the one to have proceeded with this $47 million commitment. I think that as to that commitment, that's correct. As to DRG and its, and its future activities and its further activities and its further ability to commit on that, uh, that's, that's something else again. Is there a fraud exception to honoring a commitment? There is a fraud exception to honoring insurance. And therefore, I would, uh, that is fraud on the part of the lender. Uh, and I would assume that there is probably a fraud because of that, that there is a fraud exception to honoring a commitment. Could that uh, have been invoked? Uh, from what I have heard described as the, uh, as the factual basis of Mr. Uh, Boxdale's misgivings about Colonial House, I, I don't think so. Well, is dramatic overappraisal fall into the category of potential fraud? The overappraisal was, I, and you're getting beyond me in, in terms of my knowledge of the facts, uh, the overappraisal, I would, well, I would assume, was based upon predictions, uh, probably a prediction of either a firming up or a recovery of the, uh, of the market in that area. Well, if that prediction flies in the face of all objective evidence, is it reasonable to assume that there might have been fraud? What bothers me in your testimony, Mr. Knapp, is that you're trying to justify an idiotic decision. Instead of, instead of at the time having, having attempted to reverse it. I mean, this clearly was an idiotic decision. The government gave $47 million to a project which subsequently sold for $8.9 million. And you are doing your best to justify that decision. And I'm asking you, how could you have stopped it? And they are not responding at all. I don't know how I could have stopped it. I don't know, as I said, what the facts were. I'm not even certain that I knew anything about it at the time. Uh, and nothing has occurred to me since that would have given me a basis for saying, don't honor this commitment. Well, let me walk you through it again. Let me hypothesize the facts, and then you'll respond. The responsible program officer comes to you and says, this is active insanity. We are about to send a $47 million check, government money, taxpayers' hard-earned money, for a project that's not worth a fraction of that. We'll never recover it. You are the general counsel of this department. 
Can you help us? Is there any conceivable emergency action that can be taken, litigated over the next three years, that will prevent the government from losing 40 million bucks? What's your answer, Mr. Knapp? I can't put myself fully in that position, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if someone had come to me at that time, perhaps I might, I, I don't know what I would have done. I would have asked a good deal more. I think about the facts of the situation. Uh, I, I would have asked about how absolutely indisputable it was that their judgment was so erroneous as to border on fraud. Uh, as far as the suggestion that we would just stop payment on the government check and let them litigate us for several years, uh, I really must say that that is not a course of action which we felt uh, a public agency ought to uh, take all that lightly. Well, I'm not t suggesting it ought to take it all that lightly. I'm taking it in the face of potential fraud and the description of the project as active insanity by responsible officials. That's not all that lightly. When you work as general counsel of HUD, you represent the public trust. You have to look out for the taxpayer. Isn't that true? That is correct. Before I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Pelosi asked me to raise a question uh, which uh, does not deal with this specific issue. I'll submit it to you in writing. Request that you submit an answer. In that response. will be fine, Mr. Congressman Chairman. Thank Lucas. you. <coughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Let me clarify some of the basic facts. We'll start from scratch. I hate to do this because I know the chairman, as his usual thorough manner, is going over the two most salient judgments that are under question at this stage. And I think that's really why you're here. I'm sure you made dozens of judgments that were good. And I must tell you, in all honesty, I understand your apparent reluctance to expand on the possibility that you might have made a different judgment if you had known more. I mean, it seems to me like you're very reluctant in this area. Uh, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, knowing now what I do, if I know then, what I know now, it was a dumb mistake or just a plain honest mistake. And I haven't heard that. It, that bothers me, I guess, as much as anything. But let me start rebuild this from scratch. The general counsel is the top legal officer of HUD. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's a job you had. And those seem very basic to you, but I, I just want to build this. You were there from what month in 81 to September of 84, was it? Early 1981. Um, I believe I started working in the department in March 1981. I was confirmed in uh, June. I left in September 1986. Of 86, I meant, sorry. In that capacity, did you confer with Secretary Pierce often? I conferred with the, uh, with the secretary fairly often. I, I can't put a frequency on it. Sometimes it was more frequently than in other times. It depended upon what was going on at the time. Was it almost always on legal matters only? Certainly on a legal element of matters. With Deborah Gordine, did you confer with her often? Not all that often. All right. but would she call you often? Once in a while. Once a month, once a week? Maybe two, three times a month, something along those lines, perhaps. As GC or general counsel, did you work closely with the inspector general's office? Uh, I did not, really. Did um, you, of course, knew the inspector general? Oh, yes. Did you chat with him monthly in an official capacity, or were they mostly informal contacts because of the nature of his job? And I'm trying to get a feel here definitively for how he fit with the rest of HUD that he was supposed to oversee in terms of problems. Did you discuss matters with him formally, informally, frequently, infrequently? Could you give me some bracket for the number of contacts? The Inspector General reported to the Secretary. And uh, I believe it was the practice of Inspector General Dempsey as well as Inspector General Adams uh, 
that they did just that. They reported, perhaps on a regular basis, I'm not sure how frequently, but they reported directly to the secretary. They told the direct. Really, I'm sorry, don't. As to it. other people within the department, such as me, uh, he did not have a practice of reporting on a regular or even an irregular basis on what he was up to, what he was doing, what audits he was conducting, or what investigations he was conducting. Specific investigations would come to my attention from time to time because they had been submitted to the secretary and the secretary referred them to me. But generally speaking, not that much contact directly with the inspector general. I don't mean to instruct the witness, but I'm looking for slightly briefer answers. I'm not trying any trick question. I'm just trying to build the basic building blocks for internal administration. I understand that he would have contacts with uh, personal secretary, the reported secretary. I'm trying to determine if or not, if there were a, an informal or formal uh, briefing system between you and the IG. There, there was, was none. none. There was none. All right. Did you ever seek the IG's opinion on anything where the legal matters were concerned? Or did you consider your shop more or less a closed shop as his was, quote, quote, closed shop? One did not necessarily need the other to operate. I think the latter is a fair characterization. All right. You did receive, however, copies of the IG's report. Of? Uh, HUD, the internal audit of the IG's office. You were on the distribution list. I'm not certain that I was on the distribution list for audit reports. The general counsel of HUD was not on the IG. I'm not certain that I was. Um, I think that credit? there were. I think that one of my divisions uh, that did IG work uh, was on the dis distribution list for audit reports. I'm. I'm not at all certain that I was. Well, let me throw this out. If an aggressive, competent, bright, alert, really attentive secretary saw a red flag in an auditor's report from the IG, or an audit report from the IG. Would not the first person he speak to in terms of his range of actions legally be his general counsel? Yes, I think perhaps so. Internal audit reports, program audit reports, might uh, he might well, I think, uh, that kind of a, a, a secretary Perhaps, probably first would have gone to the assistant secretary in charge of that program area. I'm coming to that now. Therefore, would not any intelligent, competent, dedicated public servant at a higher level, capable of making decisions and responsible for writing off at a certain level, uh, either approval or disapproval of projects involving public money and public trust, have therefore also gone directly to the general counsel's office for action that he could take? And my next question, of course, did anyone ever come to you for any action on any of these problems that you've read about, that you're aware of today, or that you're aware of personally that the committee may not be aware of? Has anyone ever come to you about any HUD problems and asked what to do, legally? People came to me in the, about discrete problems or, or, you know, legal matters within the, build, within the building all the time. But nothing uh, if you're getting back to the Inspector General... Um, well, let's finish this question in mind. Yeah, okay. Did, did any officers, of, did anyone come to you at any time while you were the, the General Counsel of HUD and ask for your advice that any matters pertain to anything we're under discussion today that you read about in the committee or anything you're aware of that we may not be aware of involving misconduct, abuse, misuse, abuse of the system in HUD? your purview, your responsibility, legally. On, pr I'm trying to break it down. As far as the Mod Rehab Program, which is the main subject for what we're talking about, uh, funding decisions within the Mod Rehab Program, uh, I believe the answer to that is no. All right. Um, what about any other program in HUD, since you are the general counsel of the whole department, it would seem to me that a person who had a concern about some abuse, potentially, some apparent abuse, would immediately go to the top legal officer, or at least your office. Were you made aware of any problems of any kind during your tenure at HUD by any official in any of these programs? And I'm driving right at this point. It seems to me that there was a casual approach to the whole bloody thing over there. Nobody seemed to care. 
And I want to know if someone brought something to anyone's attention, why they didn't do something. That's all I want to know. And so I'm going to lay it right in your lap because you had one of the top jobs in the United States. That, I mean, I know people that, that tried for that job and never got it. I supported four different people for those jobs in my different capacity. Never saw them succeed. So I know the competition to get there was intense. I want to know what you did with your responsibility when you got there. I want to know if anyone at any time in HUD brought any specific matter of potential abuse, corruption, fraud, or misuse to your attention in six years. I'd like to know what you did with it. There must have been one. I'd like to know what happened. I don't recall an instance of anyone bringing a, let's say, a corruption or a potential corruption issue to me, other than perhaps the Inspector General himself if he was conducting an investigation or was about to complete an investigation of someone who was, let's say, in, in the political level within the department. And even those, I can't remember anything very serious. The, the Inspector General investigation reports that, that I saw over the course of the period tended to be about rather minor matters like, or relatively minor matters like travel expenses or use of the automobile or things like that. Mr. Napa, In terms of anything like a program is being run corruptly, uh, I do not recall any such thing. Mr. Knapp, let's, let's go back to the whole thing again then. I, I just want to know if anyone else besides the IG brought anything to your attention, and you're telling me no one did during six years, that no one brought to your attention any potential matter of abuse, fraud, corruption, or misuse within HUD? Nobody. I don't recall any such occasion. Do you read the IG's reports by accident? I mean, since you're not on the list and you can't recall reading them, you mean you spent six years in HUD and never read an IG audit? And if you didn't, could you tell me what you do over there? I mean, could you retell what that job consists of? Because it, it, from my standpoint, having to read dozens of unnecessary and unwanted documents every day just to think that I'm staying current with my little world here, I can't conceive of a general counsel of a department not being on the absolute top list distribution wise for an IG internal audit and then being asked to give some kind of opinion about what to do about the obvious problems. During your tenure of officer, there were some very hot audit items. I mean, they were, they were, uh, they looked very serious. And you're telling me nobody ever brought this to your attention? You never read about it? I mean, I think this is, you know, it, I don't want to be abusive. I don't like to badger witnesses. But I'm telling you, this just, I just can't believe it. If I hired a general counsel, a top attorney for my corporation, or my department of government, I sure as heck want to talk to the guy every week. I want to know what's going on legally. And if I had an IG and had a report that was not good, I assume that my general counsel has read the doggone report. I, mean, I assume that. It is basic. And you're telling me you didn't. And I don't mean to misquote you, but you're telling me you didn't. That's correct. I, may I say, I don't know how many of broad program internal reports, such as the ones that you're talking about here, like the Mod Rehab program that went through a whole program, there were. Uh, internal audit reports tend to be rather narrower in focus for the most part. Um, there, there was, uh, it has been mentioned here, I know that there was an audit report in I think 1985 on the co-insurance program, on the 223F co-insurance program. Uh, I do not recall having read that report at the time and I don't recall anyone having raised that report to, to discuss its recommendations with me at the time. And well, I don't recall other audit reports of that kind of breadth during the tenure I was there. Well, sir, would you have had input most likely into a letter with legal implications over the, sign the secretary's signature? Would, as, as I understand when a, le a le letter of any length, of any importance, and any technical difficulty is drafted, that it may be drafted several times, and portion of it may be assigned to different shops within HUD, and it generally be assembled in the secretary's office under the auspices of one major player, uh, whether it's an uh, executive assistant or GDA's uh, uh, general deputy assistant secretary or whatever. But I understand it may take time. It may take a couple months to write that letter. The elements that go into it, would any of those elements, as technical as they would be, come through the general counsel's office and through you, over your desk for comments or edit editorial uh, revision? 
a lot of the secretary's correspondence came through my office. And the more difficult it was, the more technical it was, the more legalistic it was, the more likely it would be to come to your attention. Uh, either to my attention or perhaps had been signed off by, uh, by some lower level within my office on its way through, let's say, the assist some other assistant secretary. Well, let me just ask you a couple questions about a letter before me, and I'll identify it later if you don't mind. I, the first element identifies problem areas. And the first one says financial analysis. None of the cases submitted for pre commit review is contained a financial analysis worksheet. None. Nor any evidence that a financial statement has been analyzed. Rather, you have submitted a narrative. Would you see anything along the line of financial activity report like this? I think that what uh, I know you said you'd identify it later, but I've, from prior testimony, it sounds to me like you're reading the, uh, the DRG letter, the nine page nine letter. Nine page I letter think. from Pierce to DRG. Yes. I did not see that letter. I, would, I did, did or not. Or any part have, of it. I, and I did not have any uh, really participation in the. Uh, well, the reason and I was matters with DRG. I wasn't trying to trick you, but I wanted to lead you through it to see if no, by chance you had had any portion of this letter brought to your attention prior to your departure. It is a May 85 letter. You departed in November of uh, 86. I, I find it really disturbing. If a letter of this impact, $47.2 million, full of legal uh, language, full of tr pitfalls, uh, just in ordinary English, I, I find it extraordinary that your office had no input. And I want to make sure walk through it point by point to make sure that you don't recall any portion of the letter. If you don't when, you, when you refer to my office, Mr. Lukens, that's separate, I must say, from me. I'm not saying that nobody in my office saw that letter. Do you know if anybody did, sir? I, I don't know one way or the other. I would, my guess from the way things operated is I think it much more likely than not uh, that someone on my staff and the multifamily insurance uh, section of the Office of General Counsel uh, would have seen that letter and would have concurred in that letter. Let me go through. Rental analysis. During renovation, properties are sometimes converted from central meter to separate meter whereby tenants pay separately for heat and utilities. Under such circumstances, the, often the processing rents are unwarrantedly increasing, increased following the renovation period. So the tenant actually pays more, not the developer. You're not aware of that problem being a problem during the time that you were at HUD. That's correct. <clears throat> no one's ever brought any of these matters to your attention personally, informally, or formally in your That's office. That's correct. Okay. Expenses. Fee appraisers frequently estimate current project expenses after repairs or renovation programs significantly below past operating history of the property. Often management fees are tailored to the project instead of being based on typical experience or a model. You're not aware of that ever occurring during any time of your tenure at HUD. Capitalization rates. What's actually quite astonishing is that all too often an investor bases a decision on an esoterically propounded multi-year mathematical model of his project only to find out that although a rate of return project for such modeling was expressed with accuracy to three decimal places, the model was in fact based on assumptions or dreaming. You're not aware of anyone ever doing this in any program that had during your tenure? I was, I can only tell you this, Mr. Lukens, I was aware that there were criticisms of DRG at the time and that there were administrative actions being considered with respect to DRG at the time. Uh, my knowledge was no more specific than that. Well, uh, let me ask I, was, I was not personally brought into any of the, uh, any of the DRG controversies. Can, can you f share with me some of the frustration that we must feel that all this time, while Congress was itself greatly lax, I must say, during the same period, all this time, all these things are going on HUD, and you're one of the top two or three offices over there, and, and you had no inkling at all? I mean, are you telling this committee you really did not have any inkling of any wrongdoing or any allegations of wrongdoing as the chief legal officer of HUD during your tenure of six years? Wrongdoing gets back into the corruption kind of thing, and I think I answered that before. Well, wrongdoing. Uh, and the only other thing I can say, I think, uh, remember, I had 120 or so lawyers in headquarters. Um, and 
unlike, let's say, other offices in, within the building where, the, let's say, the, the head of the office is the funnel through which all contacts between his office and other offices in the department, everything goes through him. Uh, that is not the way the general counsel's office uh, operates now, operated under any of my predecessors, I believe, or, or operated in my tenure, simply because the interaction between my office and, and other offices within the building was simply too voluminous. I, a general counsel could not simply sit there and uh, watch things pass through in his inbox in one direction or another. Uh, I. I did a lot of things. I was involved in a number of things. But much of the operational kind of things in the day-to-day, -day, and including some very significant day-to-day, -day, uh, were conducted directly between senior, professional, long-term career uh, attorneys in the Office of General Counsel and the program staffs with which they uh, uh, worked all the time. Sir, with all due respect, that, uh, and forgive me, I'm in the business of baloney, but that's the greatest baloney I've ever heard. There's an old saying that the buck stops here. You sought that job. You wanted that job. That's a responsible job with a tremendous amount of authority, tremendous amount of responsibility. And for six years, apparently, you never read an IG report. I find that stunning. I really do. And I have to tell, I just have to honestly tell you, because I don't think I'm, I may be many things. I'm certainly not, uh, I may not be very wise, but I'm not, I think, a coward. I think that's the greatest dereliction of assumed legal responsibility I've ever heard of in my 24 years of government. I mean, general counsel is supposed to be on top of these things. 120 lawyers? I know people love to have 120 lawyers. I know people can't get seven people approved, so they start running the office. That's your job. You sought it. And I, I, I've got to tell you something. I, don't, I just don't think you did as well as you could have. And wrap up on the general, on the, uh, general question offered you by the chairman um, in terms of if someone came to you for help, what would you do? I would hope that your outside clients fare a lot better than apparently the taxpayers of this country did, because everybody seemed to miss the boat of the HUD. It just, nobody was, nobody was rowing. Or maybe everybody was rowing, nobody was looking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Knapp, I'm not sure if I understood clearly uh, in reading your letter of correction dated June 9, 1989, as to what corrections you're really making about your testimony of May 25th, 1989. And I apologize because I missed some of the questions <coughs> Uh, earlier on, so I may be asking you to go over some material that you've already touched on, but so that whatever questions I have to ask may in fact be validly based. Would you just very briefly summarize for me what the different, what, what, what are you correcting in your, your letter of June 9th? In my letter of June 9, I was correcting myself uh, as to uh, the second part of the verbal opinion that I was reported to have given. Um, and that was? That, discretion, that funding decisions in the, uh, in the Mod Rehab program became discretionary, uh, which meant within the context of that program that the specific regulation in the Mod Rehab program uh, describing the criteria on which field offices would rank applications if they received more applications than they had funding available in that field office, that those regulatory criteria did not directly control the headquarters funding decisions uh, under the process that was being used in FY84 in the later years. That was the second part of the opinion that I was uh, I said that I could not recall having given that but uh, I accepted that I had uh, and I offered a rationale for it 
Um, I was thereafter informed uh, that I had never, I had never been asked, and I had never said it. Okay. Now, the the problem that I find with that, and again, bear with me for a little bit. is that in your in the testimony that that you you had given well let me let me take it back a step in your letter of correction you say that uh, your original testimony was appears to have been historically inaccurate right that's the phrase that you use and you say that it was that and I'm going to quote it now. In my statement, I said that my recollection of the details was scant, but that I had discussed the subject of my requested testimony briefly with Robert Kennison, the associate general counsel with whom I would have discussed any such issue at the time. Unfortunately and regrettably, my telephone conversation on the subject with Mr. Kennison may have been too brief my misunderstanding of that conversation added to my perhaps too uncritical acceptance of the statement in the audit report appears to have led me to testify inaccurately. And then you go on to say that uh, Mr. Kennison, in fact, tells you that you had no such conversation on this subject and that you have no reason to, to disagree that, that Kennison would, would have a better recollection of that than you. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, if I can find it. Yeah. Uh, at page 253 of the transcript of your oral testimony and your response to questions on May 25th, do you have that with you? Yes. Uh, I'll start at line 6117, and it reads, uh, in subsequent discussions with Mr. Kennison, who is the associate general counsel in this area, with whom my limited recollection of it indicated that I had discussed the issue with him, and he's the one that I would have discussed it with, his recollection is that he asked me the question. That is to say that the housing staff asked him, he came to me, we talked about it, he went back and conveyed the advice of the housing staff. He has told me also that he believes that he recorded the advice in a note that he gave to the staff but I believe that the way in which the question came up to me in a discussion and so forth, that probably attributes as much as anything to the fact that I did not give a written opinion. Now, that's very specific recollection on your part as to, a, as to subsequent discussions that you've had with Mr. Kennison. In other words, this was not uh, original recollection on your part. You're saying that you'd had subsequent discussions with him, and these were the specific discussions that you had. That, that is a, if I may interrupt, uh, that's a reference to the telephone conversation with him, which I had just a day or two before coming up to testify. Right. And uh, when I refer in there, uh, that I had discussed the issue with him and his recollection is that he asked me the question. Right. That is a reference to the question about the, uh, the impact of the congressional waiver of the fair share statute on the department's fair share regulation. Right. Now, again, the subject here, um, he said that we discussed that question. I think in the conversation with him, as I've said, 
Uh, I thought we were discussing his having, in effect, raised two questions with me, but in fact, he only raised one. So that as specific as you were about that recollection, that, uh, that conversation, it turns out that, in fact, although that had taken place only two days before you came and testified before the subcommittee on May 25th, your recollection of that was historically inaccurate. Is that what you're telling us? I, I said that my testimony it was historically inaccurate. Um, the, uh, the telephone conversation was brief, um, and as it turns out, I did, I did not understand exactly, or we didn't break the subject matter down enough in our telephone conversation uh, for me to have reached the clarification that I later reached, which is that we discussed one question, but we stopped then. We did not go on to a second question, which I thought we had. Or must have. Well, let me, let me ask you uh, about the area that, that Mr. Lukens was pursuing with you, if I may. Uh, you testified that you had 120 attorneys in your office. Um, what, was, what was your overall responsibility? As Mr. Lucan said, I was the, uh, the chief legal officer in the department. Um, what a general counsel personally actually does um, it, it depends on any, any number of uh, things, Mr. Weiss, as I'm sure you can recognize with any uh, office head in a department like this. Um, the general counsel personally uh, tends to be largely occupied by whatever the secretary's agenda is at the time, uh, new policy areas or developments and so forth that the secretary might be involved in. Uh, the, the degree to which the general counsel personally participates or becomes the final sign-off point uh, on what I would say are you know, programmatic issues, uh, operations in programs that have already been established, um, there's not really that much of a level of consistency to that participation. It depends upon whether uh, someone on the program side, in effect, wants to appeal a decision that's been made by the program lawyers to the general counsel, uh, or someone in the general counsel's office. Uh, chooses to, uh, to bring something directly to, uh, to attention. Um, but, but I think the point, excuse me, I just want to say, please. I think the point of it is that every, every legal interpretation that is accepted within the department as being authoritative does not necessarily emanate from the general counsel personally. It's accepted when it comes from the, from the associate general counsels or the assistant general counsels who are career, you know, long-term career employees. But do those determinations flow through you? Not, not, no, not necessarily. Uh, they, they issue their memoranda uh, directly. Uh, there's just simply too much of that volume uh, to have it flow through the, uh, the general counsel personally. Uh, right. It would just clog things too much. Well, you, you heard it, uh, this, did, I'm sure at least repeated if you didn't hear the testimony itself. Uh, Secretary Pierce suggests that he was not very much of a hands-on uh, manager, that he really delegated his authority to others within within the department, uh, and would you say that, in essence, you were somewhat of a hands-off manager yourself as the general counsel? Would that be an accurate description of your role? That is not the way I viewed myself. Um, I. 
I did a good deal of uh, contact uh, with with my associates, and particularly and particularly with the associates who are active in uh, in program areas, uh, such as Mr. Kennison and uh, his colleagues on the insured housing side. Um, I received weekly reports from all of my associate general counsel, which were designed to inform me of what was going on in their offices. Uh, I read those reports, uh, given uh, current priorities and momentary priorities. I sometimes read them uh, more closely or more, uh, well, more closely than at other times, but I, I tried to keep on top of what was reported to me through those reports. and. Uh, as to matters that did not come to me, let's say, from some other route. And that way I tried to keep on with what was going on in my department. And you, you had said a bit ago that, uh, in a sense, the secretary's agenda was your agenda. So you, you, you tried to be involved. That was one of the areas, but I must also say that uh, that also was more or less periodic. There were, there were some times when uh, matters of that nature uh, took more of my attention than at other times. Well, I, 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 I'll return to the, the uh, DRG matter. Then. Yes. Here you have a situation of such great concern that you are asked by the Assistant Secretary as to whether you can cancel out a program where you, where you can stop payment on a, on a loan commitment. And you say there is no way that, that uh, you can think of how that could be done. Uh, just to be more exact, Mr. Weiss, uh, neither Mr. Boxdale nor I uh, can tell you that, in fact, he raised the question with me directly or that anyone raised that particular question at that time with me. Uh, it may have happened, it may not have. What my testimony was, uh, was that if it had been raised to me, that is the answer that I would have given, uh, as I believe more likely uh, was the answer that my staff gave at the time. I suspect it's more likely that the contact was made with my staff, but by Mr. Boxdale's even, staff. Even now, after all of the attention that's been focused on the uh, default that DRG uh, has been responsible for uh, over $300 million at this point, projections that will be a half a billion dollars before they're through. You do not have a clear recollection so that you can tell the subcommittee whether in fact you were directly consulted about uh, reneging on or not following through on a $47 million loan uh, Process, that's what was being processed by DRG. Is that what you're saying? That is correct. And do, do you find that uh, to be yourself, uh, for yourself, to be bothersome, that you would have no recollection whether, in fact, you would have been consulted or had, whether you were or were not consulted? Well, other than Maybe my concern is perhaps getting old and my recollection isn't as good as it once was. Um, we're talking about uh, what, according to Mr. Boxdale, was uh, conversations or considerations that took place during a two-day period in, uh, as far as he was concerned, uh, in 1984, uh, roughly five years ago. Um, and the fact that I don't recall uh, whether he really did talk to me about it or not, um, I can't say it surprises me that much. I think I've probably forgotten a lot over that period of time, and it, it did not, it, it doesn't surprise me that much. And uh, I mean, you're, you're, you, you don't have, how old are you? 54. 54. You don't have a greater problem, you don't have a special memory problem other than that which the average 54-year-old would have. I, I think that that's correct, yes. Yeah, right. Um, the, do you recall having any discussions with or were you aware of 
the former secretary, Mrs. Hills, uh, being in the office or, or seeing the secretary in regard to the DRG situation? I did not have any conversations uh, with, uh, with Secretary Hills on the DRG matter. Um, and as I, as I said before, uh, I did not have any participation in the, in the whole subject that went on at that time about uh, administrative sanctions to be imposed or not imposed on DRG. Yes, but did you know that in fact Mrs. Hills was in, at the agency seeking to uh, discuss the issue or, or having discussed the issue with the secretary? I heard that secretary, I had heard either before or after, and I'm not sure which, and I suspect more likely after. Uh, I heard that Mrs. Uh, that Secretary Hills uh, was representing DRG and had met with the secretary uh, on the subject of DRG. And could you, could you uh, estimate as to how uh, close the time that Mrs. Hills met with the secretary that you heard that? No. Was it a matter of a day or a week? I, I doubt it. I think it was probably somewhat longer, a, longer ago afterwards. And it was not a very detailed description. I simply just picked it up. Did you have any uh, discussion, conversation of any kind with uh, Ms. Dean about the DRG situation? No. Did I don't believe I ever discussed DRG with Ms. Dean. Not to, did, my, knowledge, not did, to my recollection, no. Whom did you discuss, or from whom did you learn that uh, Mrs. Hills had been in to see the secretary? I'm not certain, but I suspect it may have been someone uh, just in a, in a casual conversation with someone who was uh, maybe on the, uh, on the housing staff and a career employee within housing now, that I knew. Were, were you aware at that point that uh, in fact, Mr. Barksdale had placed the RG on probation. I'm not certain that I was aware of that. Well, can you say that you were not aware? No, I can't. And were you aware of the fact that uh, that Mrs. Hills conversation with the secretary was an effort to lift that probation. I was aware that Secretary Hills' uh, representation of DRG uh, was in, in, in one way or another directed towards getting the department to be easier on DRG in some manner. All right, now, did you somewhere along the line learn that in fact the probation had been lifted? I think I learned that uh, Secretary Hills had been successful in her effort. And I don't know that I learned further details than that. Now, um, you, you're now aware, or, or are you, that in fact that probation was, was lifted in a uh, nine-page letter uh, signed by the secretary sometime in late May of 1985. You're, you're aware of that now, is that I'm, right? I'm aware of that now, okay. yes. When, for the first time, had you learned of the existence of that letter having been signed by the secretary? I think uh, when it was, or well, reading about this first references during these hearings, I suspect. Because, well, when you say I suspect, does that mean that it With is... With specific reference to the, the so-called nine-page letter and right. all that, the description of that letter uh, is I heard during these hearings, reports when, of these hearings. When for the first time uh, did you hear of Mrs. Hill's success in getting the Mr. Barksdale's decision reversed by the secretary? As I, I, I think I was mentioning, I'm not certain when that was. It was sometime afterwards, and whether it was soon afterwards or some uh, greater length of time afterwards, I don't know. I was still at HUD, but I don't know exactly when. Do, do you know uh, uh, Linda Murphy? 
Yes, I know her. Did you know that Linda Murphy was interested in the uh, determination of that uh, lifting of the probation? No, I don't think so. Well, when you say I don't think so, I'm not does a, that mean that you may have been aware of it, but that you have forgotten? I have, I have no recollection of knowing of uh, Linda Murphy's role. Did, did you see uh, Linda Murphy at uh, HUD after she had left HUD's employ? Yes. And how frequently did you see Ms. Murphy? Infrequently. Um, more often at like, let's say, social occasions within the department, like farewells and things like that. Um, I think that I met with her uh, on a matter that she was representing somebody uh, once, perhaps more than once. Um, I cannot recall the matter. Um, it was not DRG, I know that, uh, but I, I can't recall what it was or even what program it was. She would come back to the office uh, whenever there were social occasions regarding uh, people who were leaving the office? Well, and particularly people who had worked in the Office of Housing where she had worked. Now, tell me what, what you had done prior to your employment with HUD. I was general counsel for a corporation in New York, which was then known as National Kinney. Uh, it's now, it's named now as Andal. Um, it was a, a diversified company. It was a spinner, a spin-off of uh, Warner Communications. Um, among it, it owned the Kinney Parking uh, companies at that time and, and a few other operations. It also had some involvement in uh, subsidized housing development. Uh, Starrett City, for one. Say it again. Starrett City, for one. Yes. And had you done housing work for Kinney? Yes, I had done some housing work for Kinney. What portion of your work was, was housing work? Perhaps 20 percent, perhaps less. And did you... Apply? Very episodic, very episodic. We, very episodic. We were involved in relatively few transactions in the housing area. Uh, which from time to time became major transactions, but it was very infrequent and very irregular. So that, that you would not have gotten your position as general counsel with HUD because of your heavy involvement in housing matters prior to your employment by HUD? Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Uh, Mr. Weiss, um, I think even the... Uh, the fairly limited experience which I've described to you uh, in comparison to the immediate housing prior experience uh, of other people who have been HUD general counsel, um, my experience doesn't, uh, doesn't compare all that badly. And did you apply for the, for the position? Were you sought out? How did, how did you happen to get the job? I saw it. Um, for a uh, for a number of reasons, um, I I didn't want to uh, continue where I was. Um, I felt some, let's say, a philosophical compatibility with the uh, with the incoming administration. Um, the the sole area, really, of government that I had had any experience with from the outside at all uh, was housing. Um, I knew some people in the New York legal community uh, who had contacts with, let's say, the, the personnel operation, the staffing of the new administration. Um, I let them know of, of my interest. 
and uh, I think they conveyed my interest to uh, uh, to the White House or the incoming White House personnel uh, uh, operation, Penn James's uh, office, and they also knew Secretary Pierce. I did not. Um, when he was named, I believe that they spoke uh, and recommended me directly to Secretary Pierce. Um, and one day I received a telephone call from Secretary Pierce. Uh, beyond that, I really don't know that much about how I got the appointment. You had, there was no political component to your day. Yeah. Truly done. the philosophical outlook of the administration. Did that apply to uh, their philosophy in regard to federal housing programs? I thought it, that probably some changes in the structure of federal housing programs uh, was, were um, were called for and that, I mean, I can remember thinking and saying at the time um, that I expected that there would be a, uh, a substantive re-examination of the housing programs during the Reagan administration. Um, there was thereafter the, uh, the housing, the President's Commission on Housing. Uh, and I can remember saying that I thought that my expectation along those lines uh, had not been disappointed. When did you say that? In, I can recall having said that in, in, let's say, the early years or, you know, around 83, 84, 82. And you, you then find, did not find it disturbing uh, were disappointing that the, uh, because of the Reagan administration's efforts, the funding for federal housing programs was reduced from about $31 billion to about $11 billion. I thought that the switch from the long-term project-based subsidy programs such as Section 8 uh, new construction and sub-rehab uh, to some kind of either more tenant-based subsidy like certificates or vouchers. To me, there wasn't that much difference between the two of them. Uh, or to a direct grant program or say even some kind of a block grant program uh, was, was not a bad direction. But, but, but would you answer the question that I asked you? The, the dollar reduction? Yes, right. Uh, the dollar reduction did not disturb me that much, no. I knew dollars had to be reduced all the way around. Uh, and, and also, knowing that the dollars in the HUD programs were, in terms of budget authority, uh, were a product of multiplying annual authority by 15 or 20, uh, and I also knew that, at least for whatever, whenever they were authorized, in fact, annual outlays were still continuing to, to increase in the, in, the, in the department's programs, and were going to continue to increase, increase for a long time. Um, the, the reductions and the kinds of percentages that are quoted as ap applied to budget authority uh, did not disturb me. You may have been asked this before, but let me ask you for the record. Uh, did you have any inkling at all of the, of the fact that there was what has been admitted to be influence peddling uh, going on in the agency for, in the moderate rehab uh, program while you were there? I would say that by the, around the, the, the latter part of my time there. Um, that would be somewhere around. 86. 86, go ahead. Um, that 
at least some political, consider political considerations entered into at least some mod rehab awards. Um, in terms of, let's say, the, the role of consultants and the fees paid to consultants, uh, that side of it, uh, I don't think that I did have any awareness of that. Um, and Never mind the fees, but you were aware of, of, the, of the political nature of the operations that you're saying. Uh, of at least some awards that were given, whether it right. be in response and to... And when, when you learned about that, uh, what, if anything, did you do about it? I didn't do anything about it, Mr. Weiss, because uh, I, I at least conceived that at least what the impressions I had of what was going on and the scope of what was going on, um, I think were, A, may have underestimated the extent of it. Uh, I'm sure it did underestimate the extent of it. Uh, and I did not think that it was the first time that uh, uh, HUD subsidy awards had been, uh, that political considerations had entered into HUD subsidy awards, so I did not think it that far out of line, or if out of line at all, uh, with, with prior history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. I, I feel like uh, saying to you, uh, where is Barney Frank when we need him? Because I think that um, he would snap us out of this. Uh, this kind of lethargy that just has us sit and listen to a story where in one instance you argued for the vacating of a regulation uh, and in the next moment you come back after a letter saying you never did it and that you never made any oral agreement and, uh, or opinion that said that regulations governing how mod rehab was to be allocated were vacated. I want to ask you a few questions. If you didn't waive the regulations, then who did? I don't believe that anybody did. If you didn't waive the regulations and nobody regula waived the regulations... Excuse me, now we're talking about the well, let me 791 say, regulation, I, I did say, was not operative when there was a congressional waiver right. of 213D. Congress, that is to say the fair share regulation itself. Congress waived the fair share regulation for all housing programs. Correct which is just a, a matter of how they're allocated geographically. Correct. Someone at HUD made a determination that they would use that as the basis for waiving specific regulations for a particular program, Mod Rehab, that required some competitive process. And my question to you is, if you didn't waive these, either in writing or orally, and you were the general counsel, who did? Your response to me is that no one did. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, if no one did, then why did HUD function as if they had been waived or vacated? And why did you as general counsel allow HUD to function as if they had been waived or vacated? Answering the second first, if I might, uh, again, um, the, the specific way in which the mod rehab funding was proposed to be handled uh, by the Office of Housing in fiscal 84, 85, 86 uh, was not discussed with me, so far as my recollection or that of anybody so, that so I've talked to was concerned. So basically you was discussed with my office, but not with me. So who should we get from your office that would tell us, um, well, let me back up. So you, what you were saying is that someone in your office was, in fact, aware that these regulations had been, are, were being ignored by HUD. And, I mean, this is a central point to this whole investigation. I mean, we have Deborah Gordine saying it was a political program. It was meant to be a political program. And... <laughs> Um, the only way that could happen is if you got rid of the, of the regulations governing the competitive process. So what I hear you saying is, similar to Samuel Pierce, you didn't know anything about it, but someone in your office did. Who did? Mr. Shays, if I may, I think I, uh, forgive me, but I, I want to take you through a little bit of the 
the structure of the process I don't mind you that taking was me in the regulations. I don't mind you taking me through the structure process as long as you're being responsive to a question. And the oh, question I, 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 the I, question I, I asked, the question I asked was if you didn't know about the regulations being vacated governing the competitive process, forget the, the whole issue of, of fair share. I'm talking about the competitive <coughs> process. The fair share was used as an excuse for vacating the competitive process regulations. If you didn't know, know that they had been, who in your office did? That's the, that's the question I want answered. And you obviously know someone did because you said someone in your office knew about it. Who knew, who knew about it? May, may I try to answer this my way and hope that I'll be responsive to you? The moderate rehab regulation uh, as it's structured, structured for the distribution of funds uh, has three steps to it. The first step was the allocation of authority to field offices under the fair share system. Uh, that is the part which we said was not operative after the, after the 213D waiver. The second step is that the field offices invite housing authorities within their jurisdiction uh, to invite uh, to submit applications. And I think that the, uh, the language within the regulations is that the field offices invite public housing authorities from areas where they deem the moderate rehabilitation program to be appropriate. That is all that it says about how the field offices select who will be invited to submit applications. The third step is when applications have been submitted to the field offices, and there are more applications and there are funds available, uh, the field office ranks applications based on these five criteria that are set forth in the regulation. So we know two and three were not being followed. We know that two was not being followed in that it was not the field office that was doing the inviting. Correct. That is the stage, uh, uh, it appears, that headquarters decided it was going to step into that role and say, when it said, Funding decisions will be made in headquarters. Okay, no, you're, you're not being responsive to my question, well, sir. No, you're not. You're, you're, you're not being responsive. I asked the question because you made the statement. I didn't make the statement. You made the statement that my office knew that they had been vacated, that they weren't following the process that they should have been following. Who in your office knew that? I'm, I'm still trying to answer your question, Mr. Chase. Uh, when that kind of a proposal or a system was, was suggested to my office from the FY 1984, uh, my office criticized the way that it was proposed that uh, PHAs would be invited to submit letter requests into headquarters asking for funds. In that it was felt that, or at least as it was proposed, the, let me, let me the invitation this. to field offices me, wasn't going to be broad enough to go let to everybody who was interested. Uh, for me to follow you, you have said you plead ignorance. You didn't know this was happening. Now, are you saying you found this out after the fact or you found it out before the fact? Uh, I found it out last week. Okay. So you're telling me something you didn't know until a week ago. Is that what That's you're correct. saying to me? That's correct. Please answer my question. Who in your office knew this was happening? In, in fiscal 1984, uh, the program office discussed uh, what want, they were I proposing don't want names. to do. I, I want names of individuals because I, I really need to satisfy my own sense of curiosity. Uh, I need to know who, who, who knew and when they knew, and then I want to have them testify because you're pleading total ignorance, like Samuel Pierce. I mean, Samuel Pierce was a hands-off secretary and it's a, it appears that we have a hands-off general counsel. I didn't know until a week ago is what you're saying to us. Who knew 
that the regulation in the process had been vacated. Who in your office knew and who told you this? Who's just telling you this now? How did you find this out? A week I, ago you found out. I went to the department a week ago and, uh, and, and discussed with, uh, with people on my former staff. Please don't uh, with, say people. With, Tell with me Mr. the names. With Mr. Mr. Kennison. Okay, so Mr. Kenson is the individual you say knew. No, I said I went to him a week ago uh, and asked what was in the, f you know, what he could reconstruct from his files. Is this the same gen gentleman who told you, wrote you a letter and said, Mr. Knapp, when you said you vacated the, uh, the, 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 the regulations governing the distribution of the, the mod rehab, you were wrong and you didn't? Is this the individual? That's correct. So this is the individual who told you that when you said to us before the committee that you had made an oral opinion, uh, he was the one who said, no, you didn't. That's correct. Okay, so would you recommend that we get him here to find out exactly? Because he's obviously the one who knows. Is that correct? He, he certainly knows okay. uh, some yeah. of it, and he had the file. And not all the conversations are well, no, I, related I'll, I'll to me were necessarily with him. He, he seemed, has subordinates also. He seems to know more than you do because he's yes, the one who told, told you you were wrong, and he's the one you went to see last week. That's correct. <laughs> And, and this is not a, just a ho-hum kind of question. The bottom line is, once the process had been changed, Deborah Gordian was right. It was a political system run politically to benefit certain people. And, and it happened clearly during your watch, and, and, and you're basically saying, I didn't know anything about it. And, uh, but this other gentleman does, and, and uh, so we'll get him and we'll find out. Uh, and maybe he'll tell us that he didn't know and we'll have to find out someone below him. The bottom line you would agree was, wouldn't you, that once you vacated this process that you started to outline with me, the housing authorities inviting it, the field op offices ranking the applications, once you vacated that process and allowed to be central driven, that uh, the system lent itself to political favoritism, correct? It lent itself to that, but I, uh, again, also recalling Mr. Boxdale's testimony this morning, um, I think there was probably an evolution there. Uh, Mr. Boxdale said that during his tenure, uh, he made the funding decisions uh, after consultation with people within his own office, within the Office of Housing. Um, I don't know I'm what not you just, I, I just the don't criteria know what you that he used, but I have no reason to think that his decisions had the same cast as what we've I honestly don't know what you just said on. to me. I was here when Mr. Barksdale was there, but that, that is a, it has no meaning to me whatsoever. The bottom line is it seems like you want to minimize what we've documented for the last two months. The bottom line was it was a ripoff to the taxpayer because there was no competitive process whatsoever. It was clearly which person had the political contacts to get the political person within HUD to make the decision that made some people extraordinarily wealthy. That's the bottom line, and um, it, 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 we can't paint it with any other picture. I mean, that was it. And, um, and you're telling us, basically, you didn't vacate the, the, the rules and regulations. You thought you had, but you had someone else tell you who didn't, uh, that, that you hadn't, and, and now we, we know that you didn't even know until last week who did. Um, and we may have find from him he didn't know who did. Bottom line was they were vacated and, the, and, and HUD wasn't following it. And you were, uh, it happened in your office that allowed this to happen. And you just don't know who in your office allowed it to happen. That's the way it appears to me. With, um, with um, the fact that you've left, you've left in October of 86. Uh, have you been involved in any HUD projects? My practice and that of the, uh, the section within my firm, of which I'm a member, uh, we have a housing practice. And well, it's, well, and it's a largely HUD-connected practice. And so, you have a, so for you to say you're involved 20% of the time, you're involved with a law firm that has a very lively practice Excuse with Excuse me, I think that the 20% reference was in response to Mr. Weiss's question about what I did before I was at HUD. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so let me ask you this then. Uh, how much of your time do you spend on HUD projects now? Uh, virtually 100%. So, so basically, you worked at HUD and now, and you waited your year, right? Oh, yes. you, uh, pardon me. Yes. So you waited your year, so you're abide, you uh, uh, abided by the law, to 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 not have an action with an agency you were you were working for, but now you do spend 100% of your time working on HUD projects. Are you working on any HUD projects 
for individuals that you may have benefited for? Uh, in other words, when you were at HUD, any decisions you rendered that benefited individuals who you now have a, a business relationship with or your law firm has a business relationship with? None that, none that occurred to me, Mr. Shays. I'm sorry? None that occurred to me. Um, well, let me only say that my, the, the major, the, the principal clients for whom I do work now, uh, the ones that occur to me at the moment are people that I did not know when I was at HUD. Um, who would they be? Other than uh, some people who were, in fact, colleagues of mine at HUD. Well, wait a second. That's a, that's that's a, a different, I mean, <laughs> no, well, I just wanted to correct the last part of what I said. The, the, whole, the whole thing we've learned since we've been here is everybody at HUD was now working for HUD practically. Everybody who was at HUD is, is now either lobbying HUD or as a consultant uh, for HUD, working with HUD or a developer at HUD. I mean, so that's a meaningless statement to me. For instance, are you, have, are you doing any work for, um, uh, or have you done any work since you left for Mr. Wilson, Lance Wilson? My, we have done work uh, for the partnerships in which Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wynn, and Mr. Abrams are partners. So three individuals, um, and obviously then also um, J. Michael Queenan. Uh, those four individuals who in, in 11 months' time uh, received one-eighth of all mod rehab because the rules had been vacated and there was no competitive process, uh, something that happened under your watch. Uh, these individuals got $138 million in just 11 months of tax credits and rent subsidies. These individuals who benefited significantly from the vac vacating of the rules and regulations, you now do work for. What are you doing for them? They were, they were clients of the office before I joined the office. Uh, we have not, uh, I don't believe, and I certainly have not, represented them at the application stage uh, or even the debt financing stage of any of these projects. Uh, we, did, we did represent them when they, were, uh, when they were syndicating the projects. Are you doing anything mm -hmm. for them recently? Last six months? Last two months? We have represented them in connection with uh, our responses to the, responding to the IG audit uh, with respect to one of their projects. What's one of their projects? Uh, Sierra Point. Right. What have you done in regards to Sierra Point for Wynn and Abrams and we, we, Wilson? We prepared a response to the Inspector General's audit report on, the Sierra, on Clark County, Nevada and submitted it to HUD. Doesn't it strike you as a little bit um, inappropriate the Inspector General investigated an activity. Uh, the central point was the, the vacating of, of a process of competition. And now you are out defending a firm that was kind of impl implicated in that whole process. Doesn't it strike you as a little inappropriate? Uh, frankly, Mr. Chase, no, it does not. Well, see, that's part of the problem, this whole thing. Nobody has a sense of what's appropriate anymore. Um, you were a central player in this, uh, during this time at HUD, weren't you? In the investig aren't you a, a, a key individual in this IG report from 84 to 86, uh, 88? Aren't you one of the key? I mean, they're the ones who said basically the regulations had been vacated orally. They thought it was by you, but now they've got to find out who it was. It wasn't you under your testimony. Doesn't it? It just strikes me as pretty incredible, but not, not to you. Um, are you doing any work for any of the other people mentioned in the IG's report? I don't think so. Um, with the regard to the letter that you sent on July 17th, that's so recent, I'm sure you remember it, regarding Sierra Point, uh, would you explain to us the, the purpose of the letter? This is to Robert DeMonte. Regional Administrator, Department of Housing. That's with respect to uh, uh, rent increases, annual rent increases. Okay. I'm sorry? That's with respect to a, uh, a pending appeal 
of a denial by the housing authority uh, of an annual adjustment to the contract rent. These, th this is one of the housing units that was approved without a competitive process, isn't that correct? It, it is a project which was funded in FY 1986. Let me say it again. This was one of the projects that was funded without the competitive process being, being, being operative, isn't that correct? Without the, uh, the selection criteria that are in the regulation being applied. I won't comment on how competitive the process was, but well, yes, I mean, this it was, was the, during this period of this time. This was one of the Dear Debbie letters. That's correct. Yeah, okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to stay and listen to my two other colleagues who I'm sure have some questions, and I just would reserve the right to ask one or two more. Congressman um, Schumer. My questioning is a little different, but I think, again, it shows the sort of same kind of lamentable pattern that we found at HUD and in your office, uh, Mr. Knapp. Uh, my first question is, from 1981 to 86, it's true that you served as the designated agency ethics official, the DAO officer at HUD, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And as the DAO officer, you were the individual picked by the secretary to manage and oversee the department's program aimed at preventing conflicts of interest and standards of conduct violations by department employees. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Could you tell us more about HUD's eth how HUD's ethics program was structured and about your responsibilities there? My responsibility is principally um, in, in, in that function uh, were to uh, review and sign the, uh, the annual disclosure statements uh, filed by uh, uh, officials who, who had to file them, um, as well as the, uh, the disclosure statements uh, by nominees, uh, the termination statements. Um, and I was consulted when, uh, when there were requests for opinions as to the compliance uh, of some activity of a, of a former employee uh, with the Eth Ethics and Government Act, <coughs> um, or when a departing employee or recently departed employee asked for guidance in his so particular what anticipated could could. what he could or couldn't do. Right, both present and former employees. How effective That's do you correct. think HUD's ethic program was? There are, um, there are always occasions when, uh, I suppose, you know, you, you don't have 100% compliance. Um, I think that as, as far as the Ethics and Government Act is concerned, um, that for the most part there's been fair compliance. And I don't know of Ethics and Government Act questions itself themselves that have uh, been raised in these hearings. No, but I know you're that saying there that there is it was a fairly question that's been raised in another hearing. No, it hasn't been raised in these hearings. But you're saying you, you would, on on the Ethics and Government Act, HUD's program was fairly effective. Is that a fair? I, I, I don't like to characterize it or to boast too well, much for Mr. Schumer. It? No, I, I, well, I'm, know, I'm not you. aware of I'm not aware of serious failures in that area. Okay. All right. In March of eighty six, nineteen eighty six, the Office of Government Ethics completed a review of HUD's ethics program. You were general counsel then and in charge of the program then. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, this was at the central office and three regional offices. An earlier review had been conducted in 1982. Let me read you some of the excerpts from the 1986 Ethics Review. And just to let everyone know, this is the Ethics Act is, is one of the ways the executive branch is supposed to check on what's going on in the various agencies. This was not a congressional function. But in any case, uh, let me read you some of the excerpts from the 86 Review. And these, are com these comments are very revealing when you consider they came from an office that during the Reagan years was called by somebody a toothless terrier on Valium. Remember, there were all these criticisms of how mild and weak the office was. Um, and in fact, I believe now that there have been moves to correct it. Here's what the director of OGE said in his cover letter 
to uh, to HUD. I don't know if the letter was to Secretary Pierce or to Mr. Knapp. It was directed, the letter was directed to you. I am very concerned over the apparent lack of attention by you and your staff in correcting many of the deficiencies we noted in our prior review and reported to you in May of 82. There are several areas of your program that require immediate attention. That's on page one. Goes on to say, the administration of your agency's public financial disclosure system continues to be poor. As in our prior review, we found again a relatively large number of new entrant and termination reports that had not been filed. Some of these your staff did not even know were missing. More, another quote, there is no excuse for holding reports that may be in violation of current regulations just because the regulations may be changed in the future. And this is from the OGE review staff. And let me just emphasize this. HUD's ethics program is one of the most ill-managed this team has ever seen in a major department. Since our last review in 82, except for decentralizing their confidential disclosure system, little else appears to be done to save what, little else, sorry, little else has been done to save what appears to be a deteriorating program. The program seems to stem from a lack, a severe lack of direction, management, interest, and initiative on the part of the general counsel, a condition which appears either to have been emulated by or inflicted or infected those on his staff who actually administer the program. That's on page 11 of their report. Our office has the authority to order corrective action on the part of the agency, which we believe could include calling for the removal of the DAO duties from the general counsel, that's you, while we are sure that many at HUD would welcome this action, we have proposed to allow one final opportunity for the DAO, that's again your acronym, to exercise the leadership, management, and direction that is required of his position. Well, I haven't heard as harsh a critique within government from one agency to the other as that one. And that's no, all directed I. at you. Would you care to comment on this critique of your performance? as the uh, DAO officer, as the... I don't know that I have a response to that. That is fairly damning, as you say. Um, when it's damning of it, you. It's, it is damning of me, yes. Um, and, I, and I don't have a specific recollection of of that report, um, never, this I would think that I, if I had read that, uh, I would have such a recollection. So you didn't read, uh, is it possible you didn't read the report? It's, it is possible that it went directly to the deputy or, you know, you know to the senior career staff. Uh, it was addressed to you. I, it I was want... addressed to me, that's correct. It was addressed to me. Um, I'm really at a loss to say anything, uh, really anything more about it, Mr. Schumer. I'm just at a loss. Maybe you should give some of your salary back. I mean, it appears, at least, that you completely ignored, that's at best, or even attempted to hide some potentially serious conflicts of interest detected on the financial reports of senior HUD officials. According to the OGE, the Office of Government Ethics Review, on page 7, there were several reports in the file which seem to typify HUD's handling of the issues raised in the public disclosure reports. In one case, a senior level official, I'm just going to read with the committee's indulgence a little bit from this report, a senior committee official reported on his new entrant report that he had several companies and management positions in these companies that had HUD-related activities. HUD's OGC questioned him, Office of General Counsel, questioned him on this, and he told him he proposed to resign his positions and have his wife take over management of the companies, and that the companies would not engage in any new HUD business for the areas which he would be responsible. 
According to David White, they don't, they don't know if the individual ever did this. He also stated that the general counsel was of the opinion that these actions would be sufficient for the individual to void any questions of conflict of interest. Several months later, the individual filed a termination report and had indicated that instead of doing what he had discussed previously with the OGC, he had transferred his interest in several companies into a blind trust with his attorney as sole trustee. The OGC had no knowledge of this arrangement and has not approved either of his disclosure forms. Apparently, the OGC was caught short and somewhat embarrassed by this as evidenced by a note attached to the form which stated, Quote, this is your office. This is so bad, I think there's nothing we can do at this point. I'd say leave it as it is and maybe they won't look at it. Similarly, in another file, a special, special agent to an assistant secretary who came to HUD in January of 81 filed his annual report in May of 84 indicating that he has purchased eight investment units of property in 1984. On July 31st of 1984, OGC issued a divestiture order. The individual left HUD in July of 1985 without divesting his interests. According to OGC, except for asking the individual to get rid of his interests, they, I guess the Office of Government Ethics doesn't have such good grammar, it should be it, never took any action against him while he was still an employee. Both his 1984 annual and 1985 annual termination reports remain in his file unapproved. You have any comment on this? Other than that, I am disappointed, uh, disappointed in myself uh, at hearing that. Um, What more can I say than that? How about a note that says, this is so bad, I think there's nothing we can do at this point. I'd say, leave it as it is, and maybe they won't look at it. Yeah, is that what you instilled in your employees? I, I certainly hope not. I certainly hope not. How did HUD's ethics program get so out of hand? I mean, was the peer style of management, it seems, it obviously infected your office which was hear no evil, do no evil, see no evil. I did not think that it had, Mr. Schumer. Uh, well, now what do you at think? At the time, well, I don't know what I think. I'm just hearing that. Uh, I really don't have anything. I, I, I really can't think of what well, to say Let me ask you this. That. Do you think your laxity contributed to the overall problems at HUD? Uh, Possibly it did. I, I How can't can you say dis possibly I, I can't after disclaim this? response. I certainly can't claim to disclaim responsibility for that. How do you think we feel, the American public feels? Here you're working in a law firm and you're making money, and I'm sure good money, on based on your experience at HUD, and I don't know if it's who you know or what you know. And yet while you were at HUD, there's this. I mean, do you think you should, I mean, on an ethical basis, should you ever have the right to go before HUD now and, uh, and practice before them? I am, and I hope that I will continue to be. How can you say that when you've just, I mean, you didn't even know of this. I don't know if it's worse if you knew or didn't know. Right. But obviously, obviously there was not very much hands-on management. Obviously, attitudes like this contributed to the problem that this committee has been investigating. Obviously, you were part of those. And you walk away and wipe your hands and you say, I've obeyed the law, which you have. Take my year off. And now I'm coming back and I'm making I'm sure more money than all but a small percentage of Americans make after you did such a poor job. And I'm sorry to be harsh on you, but 
you know, we're sitting here and this transcends individuals. It wasn't one minor error or another. I mean, it's in black and white here. And at the very best, it was a letter that you didn't read, you gave to someone who you were responsible for appointing, and... Or supervising. Was, or supervising, and you just ignored it. They all just ignored it. What was the Government Ethics Act a joke to the Office of General Counsel? Certainly not. It's sure not a joke today. I don't have any, I, I don't know what else to say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Morrison. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, Mr. Knapp, let's, um, let's go back to the vanishing opinion. You'll recall that when you were here before, I asked you a lot of detailed questions about this, and you had a lot of answers at the time, which apparently were pure speculation. And, and to a large extent, I think I characterized them as such at the time, Mr. Morrison. I said that I in that second area of the opinion, I could not recall having been asked or having given this, but having looked at it anew, this is what I, I could see as a rationale for what I, why well, I was supposed to have said what it. You know, I, see, I think the, there's, a, there's, an, there's an appropriate hypothesis for what happened at HUD. It includes what Mr. Schumer has asked about, includes what Mr. Shays was asking you about, includes many of the questions that have been asked throughout this hearing by the chairman. Mr. Weiss, other members, and that is that this is a great big cover-up as opposed to um, something else. In other words, there's a, we've been presented some theories of the case by the Inspector General that when you look at them never made any sense at the time they were the theory. Uh, we get the Attorney General saying, or at least the Public Integrity Section saying they can't find anything criminal and yet, and nobody knows, nobody can give us answers. When we get down to the tough question, the question that Mr. Shays was trying to get a direct answer from you. Now, if you didn't do this, who did it? And I don't know whether you said I don't know or you just didn't say. So, now, Mr. Kennison, your, your letter, as I understand what you're now saying the facts are about this opinion, or whatever it was, was that, Mr. Kennison told you that you never told him that other than the fair share provisions were suspended. That, that, that he never heard that from you and he never acted as if you had said that. Is that right? That's correct. So Mr. Kennison has always believed, he tells you, that all that was suspended was 791. That's correct. Not the rest of it. That's correct. And that he always acted in his own capacity as if that were true. That is correct. And we do know from other documents, from his document, that when Mr. Demery tried to write down this opinion that, that not only 791 but the criteria and distribution uh, regulations were not in effect, that Mr. Kennison objected to that, right? I miss Right, Mr. Kennison said that the uh, that the criteria would have to that the regulatory criteria and not other criteria that Mr. Demery wanted to use would have to govern that process. Right. So the 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 career staff person who had responsibility for enforcing the regulations and advising the the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary for Housing, the FHA Commissioner, uh, is saying that throughout this period he always thought these criteria had to be applied. That's correct. But we were told in testimony from you and, and, and other officials that that wasn't the case, that the whole reason that this program could be run on a purely discretionary basis without regard to field office selection of appropriate PHAs, which I might point out has nothing to do with fair share, field offices could just as easily bring forward those proposals. There's no justification whatsoever in the, in the 213D waiver that removes the field offices from any role other than a pre-allocation on a geographical basis, correct? That's correct. Yeah. 
So we've got the he, program. Yeah, go ahead. He did, uh, I, and I believe it's reflected in the 1987 memoranda. He he did approve centralizing the process rather than having it all out in the in the field. Well, I don't. He know. ended up saying that even if it was in done in headquarters that those criteria should govern. Yes, and but he, he also did not object to shifting it from the field into headquarters. And he also said the field officers should nominate the eligible PHAs, and that was the procedure that was established, and that's the way it was run once Mr. Demery put out the, the memo after the process which went by, back and forth, correct? Well, if you don't know, you don't know, but I mean, that, that is the I procedure I would have to review adopted. again the memos from him that I just saw last week. Well, it sounds to me like the political appointees ignored the rules. Not that they had an opinion that they could do something else. They had no opinion. You, you don't know of any opinion, do you? No. So somebody made this story up. I mean, it showed up in the IG's report. It's an ex explanation for what went on. It isn't true, is it? As best as you know, it is not true. As best as I know, it is and not true. And if anyone at HUD should know, it should be you, right? I should know what I said, yes, or didn't say. And they are saying you, Mr. General Counsel, said it was okay, and you never did, right? Correct. So somebody at HUD broke the law, right? It's a law, isn't it? A regulation is a law. Regulation has the effect of law, that's right. correct. And so somebody at HUD, someone in authority at HUD broke this law without any opinion saying it was justified, right? Without any opinion saying it was justified, that's correct. Well now, when there is a regulation published in the Code of Federal Regulations having been previously published in the Federal Register, not suspended, no interpretation of Judge General Counsel that uh, there, there is any countervailing reason why it does not have to be followed. Does any official of HUD have the authority to decide not to follow the law? The regulations, as you know, Mr. Morrison, themselves contain a waiver provision in which any uh, provision of a regulation not required by statute can be waived uh, upon a written good cause finding. Uh, but that did not occur so here that either. Didn't occur, that did, did not it? occur. No. no. So I mean, it could have, written, but it did not. But if we had a written good cause finding, first right. of all, we could ask whether there was good cause. Correct. And uh, if there were not good cause, that'd be an abuse of discretion. That'd be a violation of the law. But the problem here is that, that somebody decided. Yes. Yeah. Happy to yield. Make sure that he answered that last question because you started to give another little story about if there was a, a waiver. Uh, you asked a very specific question, and it was an excellent question, followed, and I just want to know the answer. I'm sorry that I must. No, the, the question was that, that, that it. The question. You said that the regulations permit a waiver, but there was no waiver. That's correct. And the underlying question was, absent a waiver, it was the there is no authority not to follow these rules. Isn't that correct? Absent a waiver, there's no authority not to follow. Now, correct. you're a lawyer, Mr. Knapp. If a, if a group of individuals get together and design a way of giving away federal money in violation of federal law, don't you think that's a crime? Isn't that a conspiracy? If they get together and agree that they're going to do something like that, don't you think that's a crime? Mr. Morrison, I must beg to, I, I am not, that's not my field, the conspiracy field that I know that you're, what you're referring to, uh, and I, I'm not going to, uh, if I may, uh, answer the question in, in, th in that way that can be construed as... ...to answer Congressman Morrison's questions. You are an attorney. You were the chief legal counsel of a major department of government. You have been an attorney for how long? 25 years plus. You are not going to dock this question. 
you are directed to answer Mr. Morrison's question. I don't want it to be read as a judgment that there was a crime committed here through the way mod rehab funding was done in these years. I'm, I'm not prepared. I don't to care what you want or what you don't want. That's not relevant. You are asked a question and you are directed to answer it. Mr. Morrison has asked me, I believe, whether or not it is not a, cannot be, whether it is a crime to conspire to do something which one person himself doing, it might not create a crime. I think that is a theory to which he is referring. Uh, I understand the theory. I've certainly heard the theory. Uh, I agree that that may be a conspiracy, that may be a criminal conspiracy. The point is, Mr. Knapp, that uh, it is often said, well, there's no, this isn't a criminal law. In other words, these distribution requirements are not criminal law. But I'm correct, am I not, that uh, when you have a set of standards for conduct and, you, and people conspire together, they, they agree together that they will, having the power to do so, not follow those standards, that that is the kind of activity that is covered by conspiracy laws, even though the underlying activity is not a criminal statute, but a regulatory statute of some kind. Am I not correct? Yes, again, that, that is an area, I think, well, at least on the state law basis or whatever basis, was involved in Governor Mandel's case. I, I must say that I am not fully up on the state of the law in that area, of, in that particular conspiracy area. Well, you would agree that, I, I would hope, that it's quite important, whether it's a crime or not, it's quite important to understand whether people intentionally, consciously, in some fashion, designed a system to get around protections that exist in the regulations and the statutes in order to make, we have protections to make the system fair and appropriate. People getting together to do it differently from that without the authorization of regulations or statute is a serious matter, you'd agree? Yes, I would agree with that. Now, you said earlier that uh, you, you, weren't, you were aware to some degree that the MOD rehab program had become political during your tenure. Were you aware of any specific case in, which, which causes you to say that, a particular grant? <coughs> I think the only one that, I, not a particular grant, other than po possibly, I knew uh, late that, uh, that Ms. Dean was interested in trying to find a way to make the Durham Hosiery Mill proposal fundable. The Durham Hosiery Mill? The Durham Hosiery Mill. I think that is the only specific project that, uh, of which I'm aware. Well, we have testimony that uh, more than Ms. Dean was interested, but that Secretary Pierce himself was interested to the point of making, giving a personal direction to the Assistant Secretary, the Acting Assistant Secretary. Were you aware that Secretary Pierce had that interest? I, I knew that what lay behind, I, I, I knew that what had led to Ms. Dean's interest uh, had something to do with the secretary and something to do with the secretary's former law firm. I don't think I knew any details beyond that. And when was that that you um, that you concluded that th about this politics? I mean, when did that when did that first come come to to your mind? Oh, I'm sure it was in 1985. What'd the, you do about uh, it when the project was pending? What'd you do about it? Uh, I did not regard that as a disqualifying factor um, if, it, uh, if it meant the funding requirements under the UDAC program. I was not, it was the UDAC program, I think, that was uh, uh, more the focus at that time when I was aware of it uh, than, the, uh, than the mod rehab funding. Well, let me ask you this. Were you, you say you were aware of, of Ms. Dean's interest. Were you aware of her 
very special relationship to the Mod Rehab program? The very dominant role she played in it? I said that I had been aware that uh, I, I think that political considerations had entered into at least some Mod Rehab awards. Uh, and I was aware that she was, she was the funnel for those considerations. So in what way and to what extent, I didn't so know. So when you think of the Mod Rehab program when you were there, and you think of politics, you think of Deborah Dean. That's fair. She was the political functionary for the secretary's office. She's the person who took care of the politics in the department. Is that right? Uh, for the secretary's office, that's fair, yes. Were you aware that Ms. Dean was lobbying Congress to maintain or increase mod rehab funds? No, I don't believe so. You don't believe so? You better, no, I think I, you ought to. I don't recall that I was aware of that. Were you ever involved in any discussions about legislative po policy with respect to the mod rehab program? I participated in the, in the annual budget process within the department. Uh, I knew that uh, certainly as the department's budget came out of the administration, we were recommending repeal of the moderate rehab program. Um, whether we in the, in the department had urged as part of our own proposed budget to OMB, uh, the, uh, the zeroing out of mod rehab. Um, I'm not certain. We may have because I know that we, uh, we certainly thought more highly of the rental rehab grant program as, as a delivery system for moderate rehabilitation type work. Um, but I'm not sure what we proposed to OMB. Were you ever in any discussion at HUD in which Ms. Dean spoke about obtaining funds for mod rehab from Congress, ever. I cannot recall any such discussion. Is it possible there were such discussions? It's possible, but I just don't recall any. Now, there is a statute, criminal statute, about lobbying Congress, isn't there, by federal officials, federal executive branch officials, isn't that correct? Yes, yes. And wasn't it part of your responsibility as general counsel of HUD to see to it that HUD abided by that statute? Yes, but I think that there have also been recognized exceptions for communications by the executive branch with, with Congress and on, on, policy, on policy matters of interest to the administration. Yes, of interest to the administration. Yes, However, if the policy of the administration was to zero out the mod rehab program, it would be strange indeed for it to be legal for this individual or an individual purporting to represent the secretary to be lobbying to put money in or more money in, wouldn't it? It is strange to be lobbying for a position contrary to what your department is supposed to be seeking. That's correct. Would it surprise you to be told that that was true? I mean, is it surprise? You've probably seen the news reports that this yes, is true. I Are have. you surprised at that? Is that you, did that strike you when you saw it as, oh, that had never happened, or that's like the way it was at HUD, people doing that all the time, or at least people like Ms. Dean and the political operation doing things like that. Was that surprising? I wouldn't say that's all the time. Uh, I don't know of other examples of it. Uh, but on the other hand, no, it did not surprise me that much. Uh, just circling back for a moment to the, to the way in which mod rehab got away from its rules. If you didn't do it, you didn't say it was okay, who are the individuals who were in a position to say it, it would be done that way? Who are all the individuals who were in office during a time when you were at HUD who had the control over the process sufficient to 
go ahead in violation of the regulations without obtaining a waiver from you or a waiver from anybody. I'd say that you're talking, um, I think, Mr. Morrison, about a fairly uh, A fairly sizable list of people, and that, uh, as you know, there are different levels. You know, there are all kinds of subordinate levels within uh, within HUD. When you go down from the assistant secretary's office down to the the but bottom levels of the program staff, let yeah. me let me just say, yeah. and uh, for example, I mean, what would trigger off a year's funding round would be some kind of a memorandum to the field about how we're going to fund mod rehab this year. Now, even that might not have been complete. It might it would have said we're making funding decisions in headquarters. It would have instructed the field about what to get from public housing authorities and what to transmit into headquarters. It would not have gone into that much detail about what headquarters was then going to do with it. Uh, but those memoranda uh, go through an a number of levels on the way up to clearance or to the point of being signed by the assistant secretary. They also undergo revisions at different stages along that level. Um, and I can't isolate for you at what level final decisions about the shape in the FY84, 85, and 86 were made. But there's well, a change. But, but the person, the only people who had sign-off responsibility or, or power, as I understand it, with respect to Mod Rehab, were the Assistant Secretary for Housing and the Deputy Assistant who signed off on fund availability. Aren't those the two kinds of sign-offs that had to precede the making of any grant? You're jumping ahead to the making of a grant, uh, and I don't, I frankly don't know what the process was for the signing, for the funding itself. I'm talking about the, the, the earliest stage of establishing the system for doing it. But the, uh, but the Assistant Secretary for Housing was the person who, who was in charge of this program it, under the structure of HUD. I mean, in the reality, he wasn't a lot of the time, apparently, but that was the that was, the, that was the lowest level in the department where there was actual disc discretionary authority to make judgments the way the rules are written, right? Correct. So it would seem to me that the only people, he would have been the person who would have had to do the waiver, right? Uh, yes, that I believe was not I mean, not the waiver would have to father. be he or someone above him, right? That's, that's correct. And so we have this string of, of assistant secretaries and acting assistant secretaries. So many of whom we've had before the subcommittee already. Who else at a higher level? In, now we're down to the people you can name individually. We all know who those, who, are the, who were above that level at the critical times when this waiver could have developed, this de facto waiver or this cover-up conspiracy if that's what it was. Who were the people involved? Secretary Pierce, Deborah Dean, Yourself, who else? I can't think of anybody else. The only other uh, potential candidate uh, would be the undersecretary, and I don't know that the undersecretary as such, uh, or whoever was, there was a single undersecretary during this period. I think Mr. Verstandig during his period, and I don't know that he had any involvement in this, in this program at all. Were you ever a participant in any conversation other than the conversation that you've reported to have had with Mr. Kennison where this was not what was done? Any conversation in which there was consideration given to waiving anything beyond the, the precise fair share requirements? No. You're certain you never were in such a conversation? I, I'm as certain as I can be, Mr. Mr. Morris, and I have no recollection of it, and I have no other reason to think that I was. So if, if this went on, it went on as far as you're concerned with you excluded from that process. If it was done at all, somebody either did it themselves, privately talked to no one, or they talked to people other than yourself. Yes. Now you are 
the person in the department whose job it is to see to it that the law is followed, right? Yes. Now, wouldn't it concern you especially if they're talking about monkeying with the rules and you're not included in the process? Doesn't that suggest the kind of intent that is not benign? If you're trying to follow the law, don't you ask your lawyer whether you're getting the law right? Yes. So if people are making these kinds of decisions and they're not talking to their lawyer, doesn't that suggest that they want to avoid the impact of the law rather than comply with the law? Yes. Thank you. Congressman Shays. I'd like to thank Representative Morrison because in, in my judgment, he's really gotten at the very center of this, of this whole investigation. And I, I, I feel like we've come full circle from the, the, the weeks and maybe months ago that we started with the first report. The whole basis for the fact that no rules or regulations or laws were broken was the IG had made a determination that you had made an oral opinion that they had been vacated. And uh, it just strikes me that, um, in fact, we can say with no reluctance at all that rules and regulations and laws were broken because you are saying to us that there ha was never, in fact, an even, even an oral opinion vacating this competitive process. I just want to ask you before I uh, conclude, do, do you or your law firm have any uh, uh, relationship with DRG. Do no, you represent do. DRG? Do any of your law firms represent, uh, law partners represent DRG? We do not. Did they, uh, during the time you were uh, an employee of HUD? They did not. Okay, thank you. One last question is re relates, uh, just for the record, because we'll, I think someday maybe have Deborah Gordine here testifying. In regards to the famous road show uh, that enabled Deborah Gordine in one of her first projects on fair housing to raise millions of dollars, or excuse me, uh, thousands and thousands of dollars, and have, a, have um, the husband of Alinda uh, Murphy provide a million dollars worth of free advertising, uh, was the basis uh, that she said, this is uh, before the IG, she said, before any of the campaigns were held, I sp spoke to John Knapp, the general counsel, about my idea, and he provided me an opinion that there was no conflict of interest in using private organizations to pay the debt incurred by the campaigns. Uh, in fact, is this true, or was she making this up like she may have made up some other things? She may have asked me that, but uh, if she did, I'm confident that I referred the question to the staff and I do not believe that she got an answer, to the best of my recollection, I do not believe that she got an answer directly from me. Now, if, if you refer to them to the staff, the, uh, who are the staff that you referred them to? That would have been either Mr. Bloomberg or Mr. White. Now, I believe both, both of those individuals were interviewed and they said that she never spoke to them about it. So uh, after she spoke to you, you just let the issue drop and you let her go madly on her way? Uh, I, well, then I'm not certain that she spoke to me. Because if I did not refer it down to them, then I must not have been asked. Okay. Bottom line is she did it. And the bottom line is she's saying that, uh, that you uh, basically concurred with that. And your testimony before us is that either she didn't speak to you, but if she did speak to you, then you referred it to other people in your office. I, I feel quite confident that if I had been asked that question, I would have referred it to other people in my office. I think the thing that really astounds me in your testimony is just the blasé nature about the whole rules and, and regulations. It seems to me that as counsel, you could have said to us in day one, totally legal what happened. You can't vacate these regulations at all. There's no way I want to be a part of it. And I can surmise that the only beneficiaries happen to be people right now who you represent, like Mr. Wynn and, and Mr. Abrams and Mr. Lance Wilson people that you had an association with while you were at HUD, correct? Yes, they were all colleagues of mine and they, at HUD. And they made out like bandits once HUD decided to follow a different way of handling it. And, and now you're even representing some of these same people. It's, uh, 
pretty incredible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Knapp, uh, we had Ms. Murphy here the other day. She testified that she had access to a legal memo in draft form before it was approved by the secretary. Are you aware of this? I've heard that she testified to that. I heard it, I heard it referred to this morning, and I believe I, I saw it in a newspaper report. Were you aware of that at the time as general counsel? No, I was not. What is your judgment of uh, having a draft memo of great importance to the clients of a private attorney being shown to a private attorney before it is finalized and approved? As I, as I gathered the facts, particularly from your questions this morning, um, Ms. Murphy was not representing DRG, so that she was somewhat a stranger to this. Um, if the department were about to issue a letter, a fairly specific letter, uh, to DRG itself, uh, which was going to impose restrictions or lift restrictions or, or, or do something of that nature, um, I don't think it would have been necessarily out of order to, d to have discussed the specifics of that with counsel for DRG just to make sure in the usual kind of way to prevent doing something unintended. But as a stranger to it, I think it's strange. She was representing a company which was dependent on getting a DRG loan. I, I think that to have shown, I would say that to have shown that to her when she was a stranger to it, and not even having shown it to uh, counsel for DIG itself, uh, I find that strange. Strange or reprehensible? I would, all right, I could say reprehensible. Would you I, I don't, I can't think of a justification for it. Would you consider it illegal? I don't know of, of in what respect it would be illegal. Well, illegal would be contrary to law. Uh, I don't know of the law that it is contrary to, at least none, none suggests itself to me. If a Department of Defense uh, attorney shows a draft document to an attorney, who is not connected with the Department of Defense and whose client has a matter which relates to this issue, that would not be a violation of law, departmental regulations? Departmental regulations uh, in the Defense Department, I, I, well, how about, I, I don't want to play how with about you, HUD? Mr. How about HUD? Let's uh, stick to HUD. I can't think of what it violates. You mean how the attorneys can show, can show draft documents to attorneys on the outside who have an interest in, in the final form of that document? People representing uh, clients who are going to be directly affected by it, uh, sometimes yes, sometimes uh, policy memoranda or other things where the department is trying to achieve an objective but to make sure that it's not uh, creating an unintended effect, uh, sometimes in the normal course, uh, that occurs. But again, in this instance, it was being done with a stranger, too. It was not being done with, a, with counsel for DRG. Mr. Knapp, uh, this is probably going to be my last question. We have been trying to get at it in a number of ways. And your very low-key and nonchalant attitude sort of camouflages, I think, the seriousness of the issue. And it is not at all in consonance with the outrage that we feel. 
explain to me one more time how an opinion you never rendered became a sort of a living, breathing document within HUD. Well, again, Mr. Lantos, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, it never came to my attention, uh, and no one ever s suggested it to me, uh, that there was a belief that I had given an opinion uh, that mod rehab funding was discretionary. Uh, the first notion that I ever had that I was reputed to have done that was when I read it in the IG report. Um, is, as Mr. Morrison has, uh, has indicated, and uh, as I perhaps will uh, will develop later as you ask more people, uh, the, the the process was altered incrementally, perhaps uh, in in the department, and without the basis even of a belief, I think. Uh, that I had given such an opinion to give that kind of carte blanche. But at your last uh, appearance before this subcommittee, you explained how it happened. I took it as a fact based well, on the... I took it as I mean, a fact are, based are, on the... You are not in the business of creating legends. That's not your job. That wasn't your job at all. Here we, are, here we are dealing with a legend which has no basis in fact. And you as general counsel for HUD for six years explained how you created that legend. And 10 days later, you wrote me a letter saying you never created that legend because somebody told you you never did. This calls for an explanation. The only explanation I can give you, Mr. Lantos, is this. Uh, the Inspector General's report said I had given an oral opinion. I could not remember having given it, but I accepted it as the fact that I must have. Uh, I, I looked at the regulation, uh, and I saw a basis on which, if I had given it, I, I, I would have given it. Uh, I was outside the department. I, was, I do not have investigatory tools. Um, I did not launch a full-scale investigation of the background of it myself. Uh, I, I did what I thought was sufficient at the time uh, so that I would have refreshed my recollection to some degree as much as I could rather than simply come up here and say I don't remember anything and, and have made no effort at all uh, to try to fill in the background for myself. But your testimony today is that you never gave that oral opinion. That's correct. And if in fact you never gave it, then people who acted on the basis of an oral opinion never given could have violated the law. Isn't that true? Yes, I'll accept that. I'm sorry? Yes, I will accept that, yes. Any other question? Congressman Weiss. Just to follow up the questions you were asking before on uh, Ms. Murphy, uh, if you said that uh, you, didn't, you didn't see how it was criminal, but you said that it was strange and you'd agree that it was reprehensible, would you also agree that it was unethical? On Ms. Murphy's part to have read it or Ms. Dean's part to have given it to her? Well, let's, let's, let's start with Ms. Murphy. Uh, Ms. Murphy's part in reading it. She asked for it. She, did, she was not volunteered that letter. She asked to see the, the letter uh, and then read it. It's, Perused it is the word that she used. The fact that she had asked for it is, is not one that I had uh, heard before. I just kind of assumed from it that Debbie volunteered it to her. Uh, I'm not, Mr. Weiss, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether that rises to the level of, let's say, a violation of some canon of ethics or something like that. Um, and, and I'm 
So Suppose I'm reluctant to you're, you're the general opinion. counsel. I would have been angry because it would have just not been the way these things should develop within the department. Because? Because it was none of her business. Would the gentleman yield? Of course. Um, isn't it unethical for an attorney to deal with a represented party through a non-attorney? Isn't it unethical to approach someone who, if you're in uh, legal negotiations or, or legal relationship with a, another entity, that without notice to deal with that other entity through laypersons, isn't that unethical? And isn't that really why you would be angry? Wouldn't you expect an attorney who had business at HUD, who had legal business at HUD, uh, to do business through the legal, correct legal channels so that everyone is properly protected and lay people uh, have proper legal advice in making uh, decisions? Isn't that the purpose of that rule? Yes, that is right, Mr. Morris. And, and again, I, I, I really don't like to be quite this contentious about it, but uh, uh, first, I do not I don't understand that Ms. Murphy was representing somebody who was involved in a proceeding with the department. Uh, and I know that there are also opinions uh, that relate to the ability uh, or the interpretation of those, of those ethical rules as they pertain to approaches to the government and, and communicating with the government. And I can't say that at least under those rules and those opinions that w what Ms. Murphy there did was a violation. I simply don't know. Mr. Knapp, supposing, supposing Ms. Murphy had come to you and not representing a party, uh, said, listen, I'd like to see the letter of memorandum that you are about to issue, you, Mr. Knapp. Then I would not have shown it to her. Because? Because it was none of her business. That and would have been a sufficient reason for me. And would it, would it have been wrong for you to have shown it to her? I, it wouldn't even, I wouldn't even have considered whether it was unethical or illegal or that. It was just was not what I ought to be doing. And she just had no business seeing it. it. It was other people's business. It was not hers. Okay. Now, you had said, you'd asked me before, what, was, was I asking whether it was unethical on the part of... Uh, Ms. Murphy to read it or Ms. Uh, Dean to have uh, shown it to her. So now let me ask you about Ms. Dean. What do you, well, how do we characterize Ms. Dean's behavior in showing her the letter? I can't justify it is all I can say. But you don't like using words like unethical? Well, Ms. Dean is not a lawyer, so uh, no, well, you, I don't like, you think, you think I don't the, like using you think, words you think like that. that ethics that, only that, apply to lawyers? No, of course not, but uh, at least the ethical laws that apply to lawyers, you can see places. I mean, they're, they're written down someplace. Uh, I don't know of a, uh, you know, of a, of a place that you can go to for ready reference that says that directly meets the situation. It's just something that you know she shouldn't have done. Because it's unethical. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that anybody in government to show a letter uh, to somebody who has no business seeing it is unethical in doing so? Yes, all right. Yes, and for the person who asks for it, wouldn't you think it's unethical on the part of that person who asks for it? Yes, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. This hearing is adjourned.